Denise here. Okay. Oh, okay. Awesome. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get let's get started then. All right. Um, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. And um, I think. Well, so I, I know there's some changes that folks may want to make to the consent agenda. We'll deal with that when we get to the consent agenda item. Uh, but also want to note that I know that we had um, put the uh, home energy uh, information ordinance on the agenda for today. That was our vote previously. Uh, the lawyer had some unexpected delays in getting us a response. And so the committee would like uh, more time and would like to push that back to May 12th. Um, we still so, haven't figured out how to connect to the. Sorry? Um, so the, um, anyway, so th anyway, we can talk, we'll talk more about that then, but um, if anyone can't make the 12th instead of tonight, or if you would just prefer to speak tonight, um, rather than uh, waiting for the 12th, that is okay too. Um, we're not going to, um, someone has something they want to say about that. We're not going to, uh, deny them, but just want to know that the committee is, um, uh, more on target for preparing for, um, a May 12th, um, presentation. So that's just a, a heads up there. Um, so we probably will still open the a public hearing if, if folks want to. Um, but, uh, again, we'll, uh, the committee would like to put that off to the 12th. Um, any other changes to the agenda? Yes, Bill. I was wondering if we could move um, items 10 and 11, the strategic plan update and the COVID reopening plan ahead of the winter operations parking review. Cameron, the staffer who's presenting on all three of those things is not feeling her best and would like to do them all together and then be able to sign off and sign out. Okay. Uh, so uh, if that's possible, that would be great. Um, yeah, so the idea is effectively we'd move the winter operations until after. I guess the... that would have been an easier way to say that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so after the summer meeting schedule, is that kind of where you're no, thinking? After, <clears throat> just after the COVID plan. Okay, after the COVID just plan. All right. So we would do home energy labeling, pool opening, strategic plan, COVID, and then back to winter okay. operations. Okay, sounds good. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so um, any objection to that no okay great any other thoughts on changing the agenda uh yeah connor um maybe a bit early but i was going to ask if we could take the cv fiber appointment off the consent agenda i just have to i think i have to abstain from that one i, I do a bit of work with them on occasion okay well and there's i know there's other things to do with the consent agenda so we'll talk more about that um then oh there is one other thing that i want to say which is that just in terms of the agenda we are going to take a break at 8.30, whether or not uh, it is falling in a nice, clean place. Um, so if, uh, if there's a presentation happening, I may interrupt you. If uh, there is public comment happening at that point, we'll probably wait till the person finishes. And then before we start the next person, um, we will um, take a pause on those comments so we can take a break at 8.30. Uh, so we just want to give folks a uh, heads up about that. Um, okay, so um, any other changes to the agenda? Okay, uh, so without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved with those modifications. Uh, so on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, and if you would say your name, where you live, and uh, try to keep your comments to uh, two minutes or less, that would be very helpful. Um, and that is true for uh, generally all the comments um, that are made this evening. All right, and so to indicate that you wanna say something, you can either um, physically raise your hand, you can raise your uh, the, the hand icon, which I see Peter has done. Um, or you can, if you're on the phone, you can just unmute and um, chime in. Uh, but yeah, Peter, go ahead. Uh, so um, there may be a number of people attending tonight's meeting with the expectation 
that the second reading of the home energy information ordinance would have been on the agenda and that they'd have an opportunity. So since the, that's not the case, I hope that this is the up, this is when we will be able to make those comments. Is that right, Ann? Uh, no, because if, um, because we'll, we'll still take it up at the time that it's scheduled. Um, so, because some people may be expect, as you say, some people may be expecting to sign on later um, for that agenda item. And so we'll check in again about it then. And then if, if people can wait till the 12th, great. And if they would prefer not to, we'll, we'll let them speak. So item seven would be the time to speak. Yeah. On that. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Yep. No problem. Any other comments? Okay, I have a couple of things that I want to relay on behalf of John Snell, uh, who uh, emailed um, at least uh, Bill and I about a couple of things. So he wanted me to relay um, that the first summer, mar uh, summer farmer's market will be held this Saturday at 133 State Street from nine to one with over 40 vendors. Uh, they were delighted uh, with the support folks gave the winter market all kinds of weather and they look forward to that same support every week this summer season and then the second thing from john snell um is that work is uh going to begin in the next few weeks on removing some of the dead and hazardous trees mostly red pine along the state house trail that leads to the hubbard park tower uh, buildings and general services for the state is in charge of the project which will be completed by a contractor uh, they are selecting the tree board parks and trees and the Vermont forests and recreation agency uh, have worked closely with VGS to develop the project over the past two years. We expect the work may take place over several weeks, during which time access to the trail will be monitored and as needed controlled by flaggers. Uh, all cut material will remain on the forest floor. We will be making a uh, more widely dispersed public announcement shortly when we have final details, but I wanted the council to know that this is coming. Um, okay, I just wanna make sure that I got that in there. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Great, so we are on to the consent agenda. Um, Jack. I would ask that we take uh, item F off the consent agenda for, for uh, a fuller discussion. Okay. And uh, Connor, we're also pulling, um, what is it? Oh, that was F. J. Is that right? Is that right, Connor? That was the one you wanted uh, to. The CV fiber, that's. J. J. Oh, it's J, okay. Got you, okay. And no minutes. And no minutes. So absent A, F and J. Um, is there a, any other changes? Okay, uh, so is there a motion for the consent agenda minus those pieces? Yes, Jack. I move the consent agenda as amended. Second. We got a motion and a second. Uh, any further comments? Uh, yes, Lauren. I, I just wanted to note, so there is a um, police supervisor's contract that we're approving. Um, this is a transitional contract, just noting it because I know that police contracts have come up at the police review committee and at some of the public comments. So I think that is an issue that you know, we've at least been discussing a little bit provisions of that, but it, my reading of this is it's it's transitional and those issues could still be part of the police review committee. So if people have issues, like please bring it to that group, um, which again, at this point is meeting every Monday uh, at four, 4.30 or five. Um, so stay tuned on the city website and bring those comments there. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Donna, and then I see you there, Constantinos. Okay, you saw his hand. I wasn't sure you did. That's all I wanted to say. His hand was up. Thank you. Uh, Constantinos. Hi, Constantinos Tavaros, uh, District 2. Uh, I just wanted to actually comment on that uh, police 
contract. And I, I understand, Lauren, that uh, the Police Review Commission is looking at it, but I, I feel like this is kind of urgent. I'm really concerned about um, one of the provisions in this contract, specifically Article 26, because uh, I believe it actually places the police above the law and will block any form of meaningful change that will come out of the police commission. The language in Article 26, which isn't present in any other collective bargaining agreement the city has with any other groups of employees, states, and this is a direct quote from it, uh, should any provisions of this agreement conflict with any city ordinance, this agreement shall prevail to the extent permitted by law, uh, end quote there. Now, to me, that sounds like if the city council passed an ordinance, for example, establishing a civilian review process that would conflict with Article 6 or anything else, that the collective bargaining agreement would prevail. Uh, but they also exempt themselves from the city personnel plan. To me, this sounds like the police are literally placing themselves above the law, and they're carving out the special privilege class for themselves because of that. So approving this contract with language that ties your hands uh, and abdicates a considerable amount of power that this city council has to manage city affairs, I, I just think it's unconscionable, uh, especially since no other city employees feel the need to have this kind of language in their collective bargaining agreements. I think this contract really needs to go back to the negotiating table to make sure that the city council actually continues to maintain its power and authority over the city management um, and employees. Uh, thank you. So I'll just add that neither of those were changes that were made uh, from the patrol union to this. Um, they've been, that's the language we've had for a long time in, in the police. With regard to exempting someone from the personnel plan, uh, the way that actually works under the law is that items in the contract that are different than the personnel plan the contract covers. If they're not covered in the contract, then it defaults to the personnel plan. Um, most of the contracts do have a severability clause. I'd, I'd have to take a look at the one. I don't have, well, actually I do have it in front of me. Uh, to see if that's different than the others that we have. Um, certainly, I don't believe anyone intends to be exempt from any ordinances. I think it's ordinances with regarding to personnel, but let me take a look at that one. And we can defer it, I think, too. It's not. So actually what it says, um, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I have to look at that. That is not a change though. That's been in police contract forever. Doesn't make it right, but it's been there. Yeah, it's an interesting um, uh, point there. Uh, what would folks like to do uh, Dan. Sure. Um, I, I think we could remove this from the consent agenda to go back on that second section. So it strikes me that there's three sections there. One is a severability clause that is, uh, at least I've seen in, in other contracts, are fairly um, common, just in the sense that if something's struck down, the whole agreement isn't necessarily struck down, just that part that's deemed um, invalid under the law. Um, the personnel plan conflict is also pretty standard too for I think what Bill described. It's a second section that I think has has some considerations and I, I certainly uh, agree with Constantinos for bringing it up because it, it does seem confusing and I would I'd want some greater specificity if, if in fact it's about ordinances that deal with personnel. Okay, um, but the way it's drawn up broadly, it does seem to indicate that Although I, I couldn't imagine something about this in a conflict with, say, like a, a, a dog noise ordinance or something like that. Um, but nevertheless, I, I think it would be helpful to at least understand where, where that second clause is coming from and how it's how it's interpreted. Um, so, you know, maybe we could get and what Bill's indicating, I think, as well, is that if we don't approve it tonight, but we approved it on May 12th, it wouldn't be the end of the world um, with with presumably either a change or, or greater clarification as to where that that second second clause that's the one that gives me pause. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes there are there are state laws that mandate certain things, and and it did say to the and again I'm not trying to defend this because honestly we haven't looked at this particular piece of language in 25 years, um, so just reading it quickly. Um, you know, it still says shall prevail to the extent permitted by law. So a loss could still override this. Um, I would simply point out that, so our choices here are, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. What the goal of this was, was that neither the city nor the union, sort of by our own mutual rules, 
um, we're allowed to bring anything we wanted changed to this contract. It was simply to take the language in the patrol contract because the, the supervisors are a new union and this is they're bargaining their first contract. So we needed to set a base contract. And so our agreement was we would take the base contract from the patrol people and where stuff was silent or whatever for supervisors, we would simply put what is current practice in that neither city nor union could suggest any substantive changes. So our choices are we could not approve this tonight. I can go back and talk to them to see if they would agree to remove this or we could propose different language. Um, or we can pass this as a transitional contract and obviously make clear we won't approve the actual the next contract that we're going to be bargaining this month starting well may um with it with that language in or at least until we've got some clarification around it. i think any of them are, are possible however you want to go um i don't have strong feelings i mean i agree that even regardless of whatever this intent is it's a little awkward the way it's worded so we should probably clear it up uh, yeah lauren go ahead i was just going to say i mean given the scenarios you laid out, like I'd rather not approve this language if we already think it's problematic and have that as kind of a precedent for the bargaining well, table. Yeah, I don't know that it's problematic. I'd like to get an attorney to look at it, but it certainly is, it reads awkwardly and I'd like to get more understanding yep. of the language and see. So I appreciate that. Because it is yeah. not, it's not a clause we've ever looked at before. Yeah. Like probably in recent yeah. history. I mean, I will note that, that the city personnel plan is in fact a, listed under the uh, Montpelier Code of Ordinances. So, I mean, it's it's not unreasonable to, to have a provision like this if, in fact, the intent is to very much, so very similar to the third clause in this. Um, it's just the way it reads is confusing. So it would be, it, it would be helpful to have somebody who's, who's actually thought about or worked around this document a little bit more just, just to answer that. Um, as well as if the, if people are amenable to maybe adding or changing language, but I understand too we're we're talking about a union negotiated contract, so it's not as if people are going to say, "Oh, sure, whatever." Um, there may be yeah. some some pushback in negotiation, but at least I think having that well, discussion will, around it offers clarity in and of itself. And I will say, um, first of all, we didn't have it was not contentious working through this, but there were um, language changes that were proposed from the supervisor union. And I said, no, we can't, it, 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 that's not what this is about. We're not changing contract language. So I suspect that's the, the feedback we're gonna get. Um, and, I, and I get that, but I'd be happy to at least talk to them about it or get a legal opinion about what it means or something like that. Because uh, like I said, we've never, it's never been a conflict, it's never been an issue, but that doesn't mean there's not a first time. I feel like that also means that you can blame us. <laughs> um, so one potential pathway forward is if someone wanted to make an amendment to the motion, since there is already a motion on the table that does not remove item C, would anyone want to, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Donna, you had your hand up earlier. I apologize. That's right. yeah. I was just gonna make a, a motion to, I, I guess you'll call an amendment to remove C from the consent agenda. Okay. Any further discussion on that? Second. Okay, uh, further discussion, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, so we've removed C from the consent agenda. So now it is absent. A, C, F, and J. Um, all right, so bearing that in mind, uh, any further discussion on the consent agenda in general now? <laughs> What's left? Okay, um, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? Okay, so I think it would be good if we could take up um, some of those items just right now, um, just get them done. Uh, so I don't think we need to take up A again, right? Because there are no minutes to be discussed. <clears throat> um, the next one was uh, F, uh, conduit uh, location in the city, uh, Jack. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm. Uh, 
the issue on the agenda is uh, approval of permits for uh, consolidated communications to um, to place conduits under uh, certain streets, um, and we can uh, Dunpatrick, Sherwood, Murray Hill, or City Side, and uh, Westwood Drive, and we can expect more such proposals as their as their work proceeds and it was uh, brought up to me and i think one or two other people that um, there's a potential that uh, other uh, other carriers may in the future want to uh, provide service to uh, addresses in the city and uh, may want to do that by means of uh, cables under the street. And so the suggestion is that if we, um, if we simply approve the permits the way they are now, that uh, the next time someone wants to provide services, they would need to, uh, again, uh, open up the, uh, the street and, and place their, their cables. And so the suggestion is to uh, modify the permit to uh, require, require them to install multi-port tubing under the roads or leave, leave larger conduit uh, with a pull tape in the conduit so that if a future uh, company wants to provide services, the, uh, the new cables could be uh, placed without additional excavation in the roads. And, um, and so I suggest we should be, at least be, uh, be discussing that before we approve the, uh, the permits. Well, I'd, I guess I had not heard this suggestion before. This is, I don't, I'd, I'd wanna find out if we have the legal authority to require this and what obligation uh, consolidated communications would have to allow other people through there since they're paying for the conduit would they have to um, you know would they be allowed to charge other people for the use of it uh, I just don't know this is a new issue to me um, but we certainly can research those things I guess off the top of my head I'd note that the, the locations that are being mentioned right now are kind of on the outskirts of, of the town they're not probably in the high population area, you know, I guess in the interest of allowing people to do work that they're planning to do, I'd urge you to approve these, but we could certainly come up with a, you know, look at this issue and have a future policy or ordinance requirement uh, that people know going in what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. it's without having given this a lot of thought. Um, one separate question. I, uh, so does, uh, in this case, uh, consolidated communications, do they also pay to dig up the road and to patch it up? Yes. Oh, here we go, we got, someone wants to talk. Hi, good evening, sorry to interrupt you like that. I, I'm with Consolidated Communication, my name's Gary Oakler. I, I can speak to some of that tonight. Um, I, I thought I'd join this to try to clear up any, any misconceptions about this. That very thing that you're talking about already exists. We do license conduits. Um, and pathways within the city where we do have extra facilities already. Uh, that is, that's available to people that are out there that wanna do this. Where we're talking today is residential neighborhoods. Um, we're talking about bringing in a fairly small conduit that's gonna overlay over our existing copper cable and network. Um, what we're gonna put in the ground would not allow for someone else to come in there. It's a fairly small size. And to go to something bigger would be much more expensive and probably not something we're looking to do um, for the residential areas. But the very thing you're talking about for the inner city, for, for the downtown areas where we have conduit systems already in existence, um, that ability to license conduits and pathways from us already does exist to this day. And in fact, I'm sure there's probably already people, um, third parties we, we refer to them as that are already doing that today. Thank you. Um, any further thoughts on this? What do you What do you think, Jack? Or uh, Dan? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. 
Oh, sorry, I just had a question, um, you know, and for the uh, consolidated, is this treated, is adding something through a conduit treated like a pole attachment? Uh, where there has to be essentially a license and agreement that's formed between you and the, the person who, pa who passes through the conduit? Yes, that's correct. There is a license agreement that we have through them. They do pay a fee to occupy our space, correct. Okay. Yeah, it's very much Thanks. like a license agreement for a pole. Thanks. And it's set, it's so presumably set, set by tariff and uh, subject to those uh, requirements that uh, PUC oversees. Yeah, it, it, that's a, bill, a bit out of my purview, but I, I will tell you, I think those are fixed rates. I don't think we, we uh, I think those are set by the commission, to be honest with you. Right, I know they are for pole attachments. There's a specific rate for one foot, two foot, you know, and there's all kinds of uh, issues around whether something's a one foot or two foot attachment. Um, but I just want to understand that it's, it's basically that regimen that that's then adopted for putting a, a, a wire through a conduit. Yeah, that is correct. Yep. Okay, thanks. And I'll, I'll just add to this, in case the community doesn't know what we're doing, we are expanding our network to, to do a fiber optic network to rural communities. With, this is going on all over uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Um, so it's to bring high-speed fiber to uh, underserved areas like this. And uh, when are you, what's your calendar for when you're gonna be doing uh, the work under these proposed uh, permits? You know, if it wasn't for the permit holdup, we'd already be underway, quite frankly. We're, we're looking and anxious to get going with this and, and move on, but Montpelier was one of our first locations we were looking to do. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah I, um, I like the suggestion of, um, you know, if we're going to change uh, any of the requirements that we put it on as a separate item rather than sort of changing it in the middle. Um, I don't know, what do, you, what do you think about that, Jack? Um, well, I thought there might be one or two, one, at least one member of the public who would want to comment. I don't, uh, I don't see him here. I think there's, uh, uh, I think it is reasonable to say, well, that we would uh, go ahead and authorize this, but also study whether there should be uh, a policy for future uh, permit applications. Uh, Dan. And, and I, I would support approving the permit. And, you know, one, one of the things to keep in mind and really the thrust of my questions are that there's already a regimen in place for how uh, conduits are to be shared uh, that's controlled at the state level, um, just as, every pole that comes. So this is the equivalent of the underground version of, of all the poles that we see um, on the street. And just as every pole owner is obligated to share the pole, you can't own a pole and say, well, I'm not putting up your fiber on this. Um, you know, these, these underground conduits have the same, same obligations. And so um, it, it strikes me that the difference here is that we're not necessarily talking about a conduit but um, laying a particular type of fiber um, where a conduit hasn't, hasn't existed. And so it's a, it's a different thing altogether. And we, well, we can certainly study and I'm not advocating we don't look into this closer. Um, it, it also strikes me that it's not a straightforward issue and that there's probably a state presence in here through the Department of Public Service uh, and the Public Utilities Commission. Jack, go ahead. I, I agree with that. And w one of the uh, one of the concerns that was raised to me was uh, we're constantly having people legit legitimately <laughs> raise concerns about the uh, erosion and deterioration of of the streets. And every time we're doing uh, we have more uh, excavation. There's uh, more of a danger to that. And so having a policy of um, what's referred to as a dig once policy could be in, in the city's interest, but uh, I, I think it does make sense to, to proceed with the current, uh, to approve the current applications and, uh, and study what we would wanna do in the future. I think that it's my impression from 
seeing what's gone on around the city that uh, consolidated is, is mostly uh, installing their fiber on, on poles and it's uh, because most of the city, the outside plant isn't buried and it's probably only where there's uh, where the outside plant for other services is buried that you're doing the uh, doing the conduits. Is that right? That, that is correct. We're talking about a, a relatively small piece of, of the town that we're actually going to be doing this in. In fact, the, I would say probably half of what we're looking to do in the uh, buried areas is going to come under private property. A lot of uh, condos and things like that that are that are on private roads and things. So, but the vast majority, you are correct, is going to be aerial feeds um, everywhere. So this is, I, I, I don't want to speak for certain, but I think we were talking roughly 30,000 feet of conduit uh, was the uh, what we were looking to place up there, and I think a, a lot of that fell onto private property. Mm -hmm. yeah. Having heard that, I move to approve the uh, the permits. I'll second. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so having uh, um, so, hell, uh, seeing that there's a motion in a second, um, uh, Peter, yes, go ahead. I, I just want to just quickly say that uh, I, I think, of course, you should go ahead and approve this. But I think Jack got a very good point. Uh, I think you really do need to explore Dig One's policy going forward, um, because the problem with this kind of uh, cable is that it is too Dan, it's too small to allow another cable to go through it. And um, even though this may affect a very small number of neighborhoods, people live in those neighborhoods. And I've lived in neighborhoods that get torn up again and again and again and again and again. Like in New York City, sometimes it's dig 15 times. So a dig, for, a dig once policy, I think would be a very, very good thing to look into. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Corey. Um, yeah, just, just to add to Jack's um, comment uh, when we do a, a reconstruction project or, or anything where we're uh, undergrounding uh, electricity or, or communications, we do get in the habit of placing spare conduits um, to help alleviate multiple digs. That's great. Thank you. Just feel like it's worth further conversation. Uh, but there's a, any any further comments on this? Uh, okay, so um, uh, there's a motion and a second. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, uh, so item, uh, oh, I've, I've just lost it. Um, yeah. Item F passes. Uh, so now we are on to item J. And for this, Connor, you just wanted to recuse yourself. Is that right? Yeah, I apologize. You probably need to do a roll call since it's on Zoom, right? That's okay. Uh, is there a motion regarding item J? I'll make the motion. Okay. Uh, and I assume one of those other hands was a second? Yep. Okay, second. great. Motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And... Opposed and abstaining, I suppose. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's the right. I guess if you're recused. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, we're going to go through the roll. So uh, I'm going to go through you as you. I don't you know if you have because there were no dissenting votes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I support that. That seems <laughs> that seems good. So um, great, Donna. Was that a, a hand? It was. I just want to thank Ken Jones for his service and his dedication to CV Fiverr. I've interfaced with him for the Public Safety Authority, and he's a wonderful resource, and just thank him. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Ken. Uh, yeah, Connor. And, and let me just echo that, and uh, my abstention is uh, nothing against Ken, qu qu quite the opposite. Uh, he's fantastic, and the uh, board we have with CV Fiverr is doing some really innovative stuff, so I think... Uh, you're going to see big things in the next year or two from them and a lot more options. Um, <clears throat> any, anyone else? Okay. All right. So I think we are now ready to move on to item six, which is the E911 road naming policy. Uh, this is the second reading uh, for this. Yes, Bill. Still, what do you want to do with that police contract? Oh, I forgot the police contract. 
What do you want to do with the police contract team? Jack. I move that we lay it on the table for our next meeting. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Uh, Dan, I saw you had a hand. Sure, I just, I guess, specify that it would be tabled until uh, May 12th, that date specific. And is that meeting. is your understanding, Jack and Lauren? Yes. Okay. Can I get, for, for the sake of this conversation with the union, could I get, could, could you maybe include it in the motion for the purpose of talking about that one sentence? Sure. Thank you. Is that okay with you also, Lauren? Yes, okay, great. Um, okay, any further discussion? Okay, so this is a motion to table it until the May 12th meeting. Um, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, Constantinos, for bringing this to our attention. Um, all right, so, uh, we, now, so now we are up to the E911 road naming policy, the second reading um, of this uh, ordinance change. Uh, so I'm going to officially open the public hearing and uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Mike Miller, Planning Department Chair, well, not Chair, <laughs> Director. Hi. Yes, good evening. So Mike Miller, um, Planning Director for the City. So. Uh, I'm just going to go through a quick um, uh, the the quick PowerPoint similar to the one I gave last time, just to make sure all of everybody's up to up to speed on what we're talking about. Um, I don't know if I need Cameron to just give me power to do that. Hi, Mary's going to be our sort of um, ah. the meeting tonight. So if Mary, you can give him permission, you just have to click off of um, under security, you have to click next to, there we go, Never mind. thank you. All right, so, um, there we go. So uh, again, this, so this is the second reading of the street naming and numbering uh, and building numbering ordinance. Uh, so quick summary, this, uh, existing, this, this existing ordinance is in chapter three, article six, which is in the public works um, and was originally adopted in 1970. And under that ordinance, the public works director is responsible for doing all of these. Um, but in reality, we haven't been following our ordinance. Um, I don't want to always admit to that, but you know, we, we started to do E911 in the late 90s and since that time we've had an e911 coordinator and we've been um, mostly following those rules for any new um, new naming and numbering so what we wanted to do is to make sure that we got the new ordinance in effect and that would meet the new e911 requirements we'd pretty much be codifying what we're already doing so the road naming would still be done by the council, the addressing by our E911 coordinator. Um, and because the existing ordinance has no reflection in, in what we're doing, it, this is a strike all replacement of the existing ordinance. And after the first reading, we moved uh, this to chapter 17, article two. So it's now under emergency management um, as opposed to under public works. Um, hey, Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you. I um, just had a request or question about um, the possibility of making the screen larger so that it might be easier to see the words. Can you get so you're not showing the second next slide oh does it show two slides at once it does oh. yeah ah well it wasn't on my screen so uh, um let's see what happens um if you, you go to slideshow start you should be able to go and start from the beginning there you go that's good for you guys. 
Oh no, we still got oh. it. It was good. We're seeing, we're seeing his screen. I don't know if we're gonna be able to do any better. Yep. Well, hold on. Let me get out of here again. Um, and I'm gonna that and swap screen. Mike, I'm getting oh. um, information. If you go up to the top where it says display settings on your screen. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. Sorry. So I already go got from out beginning. It. It click from beginning again. All right. Now at the top, right now on your screen, there should be a thing that says display settings. Now swap presenter view. Uh -huh. Yep. There we go. Yeah. There we Great. go. All right. I will try to remember that for next time. Um, so uh, authority and purpose. Um, the authority is under chapter 59 and 61. So this is where most uh, city ordinances are that are not zoning related. Um, the zoning comes out of chapter 117. Most of our other ordinances come out of 59 and 61, which this does. And the purpose is to protect health, safety, and welfare by establishing a uniform street naming and addressing system. And really the, the most important reason for doing this is to enable emergency services to locate every address and structure and uh, so the issues, uh, as we mentioned, is that um, we are not consistent with the rest of Vermont, which could impact, it hasn't, but it could impact um, mutual aid calls in the future. Um, and the big, big reason right now for us is that we've run out of uh, numbers. The, our current numbering system doesn't allow for a sufficient number, uh, a sufficient set of numbers. Um, so therefore roads can run out of numbers. Of course, you're not running out on the end, you're running out of numbers in the middle. So every structure needs to have a number. So if you have a 39, 41 and 43 Berry Street and you have a building in between them, you have no number for them. And that is exactly what has happened on Hubbard Street, Berry Street and Cumming Street is that we have too many buildings and not enough numbers for them. Uh, so in, in the ordinance that you have, um, you'll notice that uh, you know, section 203 has the rules for street names, 204 for building numbering, which is addressing. Um, we will be keeping our existing system of odd numbers on the right and even numbers on the left. And I mentioned that because that is opposite of what the rest of E911 in the state is like, but because we already have some numbering like that, the E911 board has given us a waiver and has said it's fine for us to keep our existing odd numbers on the right system. And uh, so those, the addressing will be administered by E911 coordinator, as I mentioned, and it will be consistent with the E911 board rules. And enforcement, which is a requirement of any ordinance, not that we expect anything um, that is really gonna need enforcement but it is a requirement. So it's designated as civil. Nobody will be thrown in jail for this, for any violations. Um, and then 206 talks about penalties and 207, the severability clause. So our next steps after, uh, once this is adopted, the e one coordinator will systematically review and renumber non-compliant streets. Obviously starting with the ones that are the, that are the biggest problem. Um, we'll get some assistance from the fire department um, and there are some streets that are already compliant. And I did talk to Audra about this after the last hearing. And uh, there are a number of streets, I don't wanna even get their hopes up, that they're one of the ones that address won't be changed on, but um, there are more than just these three. Um, a lot of them in the more rural areas have been renumbered. So uh, your North Street, your Gould Hill, Murray, um, uh, the, num the, the, the roads that are off of Town Hill, many of them have been renumbered. So, um, but a lot of the ones in the, in the core downtown have not. Um, and usually you can tell pretty quick if, if you're number 10 and your neighbor is 12 and the next neighbor is 14 and the next neighbor is 16, chances are good you're, you're gonna be on the list to get renumbered because we have no way of numbering any other building on a street like that. Um, our plan is to do the downtown core last that may take years before we get there. And that's just due to the impact it, it'll have on businesses. We will um, kind of tackle that area at the end. Um, road naming will continue to be with the city council um, with input from the E911 state coordinator. 
And that's because the state coordinator will look at and approve names based on surrounding towns as well. Our post office covers multiple towns, so we have to have unique road names, not only for Montpelier, but as they expand into these other towns. And we will rename some streets um, as well as we're moving along. And I think I pointed out last time that we have a school street and a school lab and a Scribner street and a Scribner place. So and there may be some others that I don't know about. Um, and that was, uh, that was it. So what you do have uh, in your packet was um, you know, the strikeout copy didn't look like it came out quite right when I was printing out copies for tonight. So I can go over um, Dan Richardson provided some comments, which um, you, your clean draft does reflect those um, those changes, and I can go over what those were, um, but they were uh, relatively um, straightforward strikeout changes. Okay, first off, any comments on this from Council? <laughs> okay, any comments on this from the public? You can raise a hand. Oh, Peter, go ahead. I didn't expect to encounter this, but um, I've got two questions related to uh, uh, this is Peter Kelman. I live on Mountain View Street or Mountain View Street. Um, how will the uh, coordinator uh, look at names of streets where the post office has it one way and the town has it another, or the street uh, street, or at least the street signs are another? I don't know what to tell people whether it's Mountain View or Mountain View, and uh, and there are, and there are internet forms that I've had to fill out like tax forms that don't accept it. I can't remember now which one. They won't accept it one way. It's in their system as no, not a legitimate address. So that's one one question. How how will that be handled? Will you be in, will you be working with the post office? Will you be work I, I, or, or whatever the entities are that establish these? Th this is a legitimate address. And the second question I have is, with more and more uh, uh, ADUs, additional dwelling units, and duplexing, and for example, we converted a um, an in-law apartment into a rental unit and suddenly our house has to become apartment one our whole house and then the 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 uh, the rental apartment becomes apartment two i don't live in an apartment i live in a home is there some way to be more flexible about the way these these numbers are going to be uh, assigned so we follow, so uh, the first question on, on the road name. So there will be an official road name um, and Audra would have to look up what is in the E911 directory for that road. Um, if it needs to change, that's something that would have to go to city council. So we, we don't have any plans to go through and, and review them to, the, to that extent, but if somebody brings up uh, a concern like yours, we can certainly review it and make an official determination because whatever's in the E911 directory is what emergency services is using. And if the street sign is wrong, um, we can always go through and work with uh, Donna and the folks at Public Works to print out a new sign and replace it if the sign is incorrectly spelled or incorrectly organized. And, and Mike, just to clarify, the E911 is lined up with the post office, is that right? Yes, it should be, um, because when we make a change on E911, one of the mandatory um, ones we're supposed to send to is to the post office, a notification. Okay, and the second, and second question? The second one um, is a common um, complaint, but it is the E911 rule. So as we add in additional units into a structure, now if the ADU is a separate building, and this is where we end up with problems on a number of streets that number 20, 22, 24, 26, is somebody puts a, a tiny house in the backyard that needs a new number and there's no number for it. Um, but if it's a separate structure, it will get a separate number. If it is within the same structure, then you have, um, it's either I believe a, an apartment one and two or a unit one and two. 
And I know in cases where people live in one and rent the other one out, they, they don't like the connotation of being in an apartment or, or a separate unit, but the way E911 works is they're coming to a structure and it's a multi-unit structure and that's the way the, the numbering system works. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments on this? And you can um, unmute yourself or you can physically raise your hand or you can use the raise hand icon. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Hey, I just have a question for Mike. So this means a lot of address changing as you go along. Do you, do you have an idea as to the timing, like how long it'll take to do all these sections? I mean, is the whole town going to be doing address changes in the next 12 months or is it going to take longer? Oh, it's going to take longer than 12 months. Um, we had talked in the past pre pandemic about, you know, maybe getting some help from uh, a high school student or para high school students to kind of help with this. I think a lot of it is going to come down to, um, you know, um, Audra wears many hats. Uh, she is one of our employees that, that has a lot of hats to wear. And so this is one of those activities that works in while, you know, when she has windows of time, you know, in the fall or in the winter to, to really work on these things. Um, it's probably not something that we're going to be able to just jump right in and jump on. Um, so it's going to fit in to her other work that she's working on. Um, and we're going to try to get, as we said, the, the most important streets done, those streets People can get advance warning uh, that this is going to be happening and not be surprised. Yeah, our plan was to break it into. I think it's in your strategic plan and our in our strategic plan that uh, the first we, we broke this into three steps. One was um, change the ordinance. Number two is public outreach. Number three is to actually make the changes. So we'll probably, you know, when we get done adopting the ordinance, our next step would probably be to identify what we're going to do and then start doing some public outreach. Um, to make sure that we reach out to the folks to let them know this this is our schedule. These are the you know these are the streets that we're going to be looking at doing, um, just so people have an idea. Um, I did some of these when I was um, over in Barry City when I worked there. We did a, a lot of E911 corrections when we were over there, and we are always very conscious of of other people's things. So we we had policies that we wouldn't after between Halloween and New Year's we would not change any addresses because we were not gonna be the ones who messed up everybody's Christmas cards. So, you know, we, we, we try to be as, as conscious and um, work as much as we can with folks um, with, within the rules. Thank you, that's helpful to know. I also just wanna recommend that this might be a good place to, to uh, interface with the CAN uh, neighborhood folks uh, who are you know, working on that neighborhood level. Um, Jack. First off, thank you for these two presentations. Uh, they've been very informative and this really uh, <clears throat> just is another instance of how, in my view anyway, the, uh, the business of government is just endlessly fascinating. And my, <clears throat> I, was, I was on vacation in Florida last for our last meeting and uh, members of my family were uh, quite entertained by the possibility that we could run out of numbers. Um, now, with regard to the, uh, to the address, uh, and I also noticed uh, just as you were talking that there is a, a school street in Berlin. However, 
that's not in the 05602 part of Berlin. It's in the 05663 part of Berlin. But there could be other uh, instances we need to think about. Um, when, if you're living in one of the streets that has a, that where you have to have your number, your address changed, will that require the resident to uh, file a change of address with the post office? I would assume the answer is yes. Um, yes. It's a, it's a sort of a yes and no. We, um, when we notify, when we do a street change, the, the address change goes to, we, we automatically outreach to, a, there's like five people that we automatically contact. Um, uh, e, we, the E911 board, we contact the post office, we contact um, Comcast, um, and there's another one, and it really just comes down to because all of them, all of them link into the E911 system. So, we 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 make a number of those contacts, um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, the homeowner is going to have to then reach out to anyone that's not of those. Um, but the post office knows, and what happens if? They'll start to obviously when when the date comes, they'll start sending notices that says you know you need to update these, you need to update these, and then at the you know in the end they'll start rejecting mail to an address where people haven't updated their addresses. Yeah, I think a forwarding ad order lasts a year, so it should be okay. Yeah. So, um, but yes, we we contact a number of people because it's part of the E nine one one system, but the rest of them are up to the property owner to do it. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add one other note, um, Mike, and I'll, I'll echo Jack that I appreciate the, all the information you've shared with us and how sensible these changes are. It, it seems to me like it would probably benefit um, the city and all of us if there's, there's even another um, level of communication that happens to these places, uh, to, to, to residents before these changes happen. Um, as opposed to just reaching out and saying, "Hey, this is th this is this change, and this is what you need to do," it feels to me like it would it would be smart to be proactive in our communication and reach out to folks. And you can prioritize it based on how you see um, these changes rolling out. And obviously, you're very sensitive to you know it's not like you're just doing it blindly. You're very sensitive to how um, these changes will impact homeowners. But I think the more, the sooner we can reach out to people and say, hey, this is happening and this is why, and this is why it's important um, and safety is involved, you know, the better. And then it's, so it's sort of like a layer of like, this is, this is why these changes are happening. And then letting folks know that we'll be in touch when the changes start to happen, not just, not just having the first point of contact from the city be, these are the changes that are happening. I think just so people come into this process understanding the why, not just the process, I think is gonna be really important. Because, you know, I mean, it's, it's gonna be disruptive. Just the logistical things that we're talking about here are gonna be disruptive for people. Um, so the, the sooner we can reach out and just engage with folks about the, the importance of, of these changes, I think is um, gonna have a lot of benefit. So um, I, I appreciate that that's, you know, another, you know, layer, layer of work, but, but I think in the long, taking the long view here, it will um, not only, it will just make the process of the transition a lot easier for, for our residents. So thanks. Any other comments? Uh, Connor, go ahead. I was going to make a motion, but I think Peter just raised his hand. So I just want to just quickly say that uh, uh, Mayor Watson's idea about using the can roofs, I think, is a very good one, uh, um, Mike, um, in, in, in line with uh, what uh, Jay was just suggesting. I'm a can coordinator, and it would be a great thing for me to be able to go around the neighborhood and to talk to them about it. I think it would be that that's the kind of thing that will 
can can help the neighborhood and and this having something like this gives can a reason to show the neighborhood of its importance. Thanks. Thank Good. you. Connor. All right. And I, I, I definitely agree with that, Peter. Um, I think they'd be excited to do that too. Uh, so I guess I'd move to accept the uh, draft D911 ordinance as presented tonight. Second. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Any further comments from the public or from council? Okay, so I'm gonna officially close the public hearing. And uh, so there's no further discussion. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that passes. And uh, thank you so much, Mike, for all of your work on this. And please also pass along our thanks to Audra <laughs> um, in advance of all the work that I know this will mean for her. Um, thank you. So anyway. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so we are on to uh, item seven, which is the Home Energy uh, Information Ordinance second reading. Um, now, I just wanna clarify, uh, Bill, yeah, um, go ahead. Yes. Hey, can I just, a quick interruption in the schedule of events. It occurred to me, and this will be very brief, that um, although it's been like more than half a year, most of you have not met Mary Smith in our office in person, and she's on the call tonight. So I thought I would actually introduce her to most of you since we've, she, we've been in quarantine ever since she started with us, but she's helping us out with uh, some of the stuff she's actually gonna, she's doing some of the uh, Zoom admin work that Cameron normally does, but because Cameron wants to go to sleep, Mary's pinch hitting. So thank you, Mary. It's been uh, awesome having her with us. She's great. Um, so this is the person behind your emails. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Uh Hi, everybody, and it's nice to put faces um, to all of your names, and uh, happy to be here. Great. That was all. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary, for being here, and uh, it's good to see you. <laughs> and also put a face to the name, though I know we've met, but just for, for everybody's sake. Yeah, that That's was great. it, as you were. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, all right, so um, at, going into um, item seven here. Uh, I pointed this out at the beginning of the meeting, but I want to reiterate it now. Um, the committee uh, that has been working on this has requested that we uh, put off the uh, hearing until, um, or a vote anyway, until um, the next uh, council meeting, till May 12th, because the lawyer needed some more time. He had some unexpected delays. Um, in getting back to us. And so um, we wanted to make sure that we had enough, um, we, that if there was uh, information to go along with this, that it was all together in the, the same sort of package. Um, so having said that, if folks are uh, willing to hold their comments until May 12th, that's great. If you would prefer, uh, you know, you're here now, you would like to speak to this topic, that is fine. Um, and, uh, or if, if for some reason you can't make the 12th and now works, um, that is all right. Um, so uh, we'll still uh, open the public hearing in case that is true for anyone, uh, but just know that the committee will not be making a presentation tonight uh, on this topic. Um, hopefully that is clear. Um, if you would like to make a comment on this, that is fine. Um, you can either physically wave, you can use the raise hand icon, uh, or if you are on a phone, you can just unmute yourself and let us know that um, you wanna say something. Um, again, just uh, if you would say your name, uh, where you live, and um, try to keep your comments to about two minutes if you can. Um, I think that is it. Who, is, is there anyone who would like to make a comment at this time? Oh, Tim, yes, go ahead. And then I'm saying thanks, Ann. Just quick question. So if you're moving process question, moving to May 12th, um, is that the second hearing and the vote? Well, so one could consider that the third hearing potentially. Um, if we're uh, so if I'm opening, let's I don't think I did this um, prior to your comment, Tim. So I'm gonna officially open this as a public hearing. Um, so that would make that the third public hearing and potentially a vote. Okay. 
just doesn't feel like it gives a lot of time for conversation between a public hearing and a vote if you're doing it all in the same meeting. Um, so you can certainly um, uh, have comments now. This is also pretty normal for as a process for us, just like we did with the previous item um, where we had a, a second reading, the second presentation and a vote. Okay. Um, I guess quickly, um, it just seems like the last meeting that I attended, which I think was the last one, but I'm not sure if you've had other meetings since because this whole Zoom thing's a bear to keep track of. Um, but um, it seemed like the city really wasn't ready to implement this um, and felt like it was being rushed into. There was no staffing allow allowance set up. You really hadn't allocated how it was going to be handled. Um, you know, the, yeah. the algorithm that people are using um, everyone I know that's gone in and tried it has come out and just said, this thing doesn't work. Uh, it, it just feels like it's not ready to go. Um, and if in fact, we're really doing this as a political ploy to um, get something going at a different level at the state level, uh, it doesn't, it's just not good public policy for Montpelier for our voters. I don't think it's the right thing to be doing right now. So um, I have a lot of concerns about it. I know you're not opening for a lot of comments, so I'll try to end with that and keep it brief, but I, I really feel like we shouldn't be enacting this ordinance at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Susan. Uh, Susan, I think you are still muted. Susan Labarth, I live in District 2. Um, I think I always have to look it up on election day. Um, I, I uh, would like to second uh, Tim's uh, remarks um, strongly. I, I, I don't think it's ready for prime time. I have several um, concerns. I'll keep it brief and I'd like to say more at the next meeting um, when there's the opportunity to hear the presentation. I did listen, I did um, listen to the presentation the last time. Um, just to be brief, my four my four concerns um, uh, concern uh, first of all, and my first reaction was God no, um, was with regard to the executor of my estate because I'm not planning to go anywhere or sell my house, but for my son to have to dredge up the information necessary to do this accurately, I think would be a nightmare. Um, it, admitting that my file system, if a little random, if not chaotic, would be a challenge. Um, and because of some of the features of my house, um, I, I don't think that the one that, the kind of standard one wouldn't suit, would not be accurate. So that's that. Um, my second concern is uh, the presentation I thought gave us a lot of vague promises about how this was going to uh, affect, uh, 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 I don't know, CO2 emissions or, or whatever it is, um, the, the global environmental situation in the city. Um, and um, beyond that, uh, how easy it is, how accurate it is, all that kind of thing, what it really tells you. Uh, I don't want these global kinds of statements about how wonderful it is. I want to hear some studies with uh, data and p-values and uh, demonstration of validity, reproducibility, and so forth. Um, I, no, 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 not, not these vague promises about how wonderful it's going to be. Please, let's have some data. Um, and what was the size of the, um, what was the size of the study and, and so forth and so on. So we can have some way to judge whether this is even workable. Um, the third thing is I tried to go to the site to put my house in to see how it worked and what was exactly involved and, and kind of judge my concern for my executor when the time comes. And I couldn't get access to it. I tried different, um, oh, what do you call it? Um, Firefox and, and um, 
Safari and so forth. And it's not, it's not the search engine that I'm using, it's the site. Keep getting error messages. Sorry, something bad happened. We're, we're aware, we're working on it. Oh yeah, fine. And okay. that's gonna happen when I'm planning the list tomorrow. I mean, mm, be serious. Um, and then um, I think uh, number four, we haven't really heard what's behind the algorithm or you know what's in it what what does how does the algorithm work i'd like to hear more details about that so um that's the gist of what i have to say and i may come up with more details but i'd like to hear the next presentation first and i do not think it's ready for a vote thank you night thank you um uh ben ben huffman go ahead thanks <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Anne. I want to just say on a personal note that I'm not somebody who has to chime in on every issue that the council deals with. But aside from the climate calamity and the relation this proposal has to that, what has captured my interest is the fact that I've spent a career doing lots of data analyses that are related to developing policy. And frankly, the inadequacies in this proposal have just been driving me nuts. And um, I, I just wanna say that as the, whoever is working on this over the next couple of weeks or so further, that I hope that there will be some really careful attention given to what uh, uh, the last speaker just reference in term of the uh, the algorithm and what uh, the main point of the profile as I see it, which is the the rating, the single number that encompasses all forms of energy used in a, in a home. And in my opinion, that is just not a credible piece of information. I think that um, as people begin to use the profile as it now stands, they're going to, first of all, as I find as I did, that filling out the required pieces of information the way that one has to do it does not give me a sense of confidence about how my home would be characterized in the profile, which then in turn leads to questioning however the algorithm is working. It's credibility given that set of data that's going into it. But more to the point about the algorithm is the fact that it's the proprietary and therefore there's absolutely no documentation offered as Susan just mentioned as to the um, assumptions, the uh, data that's other than what's provided by homeowners or any of the calculations. And so it's really impossible to I think even understand what it's purporting. And for the city to adopt the pro use the profile as it stands, I believe would be irresponsible. And but beyond that, Given that we don't know what uh, how the algorithm is determined, the, the the information that it purports, I think the the algorithm or the the rating on its face is illogical in that it brings together two sets of data that are apples and, and oranges. One being what are the physical characteristics of the building that are going to have a direct effect on energy use. And that of course has to do with space heating, but ex except for any use of electricity and heating, all of the electrical uses that are uh, involved in that totality have nothing to do with the physical characteristics of the building. Yet the purpose of this whole thing is to give a potential buyer information about what is this house going to impose on me as a homeowner as to the energy that I use. And all of that electricity used for appliances, for devices, et cetera, is irrelevant. 
Um, and so I think what's going to happen if this, if this profile is put into place and actually used as it's been presented so far, that it's going to quickly become realized and recognized among people relating to real estate transactions as something that's essentially meaningless, but a necessary annoyance that you have to tolerate in order to sell your house. And that obviously would not be a desirable outcome. So I, I just hope that some serious attention will be given to that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, others? Okay, not seeing any others at this point. Oh, um, Peter, go ahead. Okay. So the first thing I want to make clear is that I'm very much in favor of the city taking meaningful and appropriate steps to reduce energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions in Montpelier. And also that I recognize that home energy use uh, is a major contributor to global warming. Although importantly, I would observe that there are other major contributors on which municipalities can also focus. Motor vehicles and commercial and municipal buildings, facilities, equipment, and activities. However, as well intended as this ordinance certainly is, its provisions, even if carried out flawlessly, will do very little to help Montpelier attain its net zero energy goals. And I don't think it is appropriate for a municipality to use or attempt to justify such an ordinance as providing consumer protections that in fact already are available to prospective home buyers. Furthermore, and this is my main concern, this ordinance stands a very good chance of causing harm to some of the city's more vulnerable individuals and groups, particularly senior homeowners. And finally, as currently written and conceived, the ordinance contains a number of significant flaws in its wording, design, implementation plan, and the overall planning process that got it here, this mysterious committee, the Energy Advisory Committee all of which makes it unlikely to succeed either for the city or as a model for other municipalities, which has been suggested by some of its proponents. Let, I just wanna briefly identify some of the major areas of concern that don't seem yet to have been addressed by proponents of the ordinance. Council member Richardson has posed a number of questions regarding liability and other legal issues, as well as implementation and technical challenges. Yet few of these questions appear to have been addressed at least in the currently revised draft. And the point that was made earlier, if the first time we see a further revision is in two weeks from now, and you guys are gonna vote on it immediately, that just seems like a, a, a not the right way to do it. Even if it has been the way that some um, more routine um, um, uh, ordinances go ahead. Ben has raised a number of truly troubling technical concerns about the proprietary algorithm driven VHEP that's required by this ordinance, which unless and until it goes through absolutely necessary beta field and stress testing would not be ready for responsible implementation. I spent 15 years as a software publisher and developer. I would have been written out of my industry if I would have put out something which has had as little uh, real testing as this uh, um, algorithm driven um, tool has. I too have shared a number of my concerns, most importantly, the strong possibility that the ordinance as written has the potential to harm senior homeowners as well as other vulnerable members of our community. And it is my view that it would be irresponsible for the city council to pass an ordinance like this without first carrying out a fiscally and socially responsible cost benefit analysis of it. And I see no evidence that that's happened, none whatsoever. Questions have also been raised about whether there's been sufficient and timely stakeholder involvement in creating this ordinance, or at least in reviewing it. The presentation slides referenced only a couple of meetings with real estate professionals and a sparsely attended late August public hearing over Zoom. 
hardly the quote, robust and inclusive stakeholder process promised in the May 9th revised proposal for this ordinance submitted to the legislature. Also, the entire consumer protection rationale put forth by proponents, including clever but deceptive analogies to vehicle mileage labeling, appears to be a solution in search of a problem. The arguments offered, the assertions made, the claims of studies supporting the consumer protection benefits are all almost totally without merit, and I would be glad to provide in detail why that's so. I don't have time now. Moreover, some of the proponents' more dubious assertions do not appear to have been checked with knowledgeable real estate professionals, financing institutions, or even the city's own assessor. Finally, let's consider the mandatory nature of this ordinance. Problem, backlash. Mandates regarding personal choice, particularly ones that could have significant financial costs, and I'm not talking about costs of, you know, getting a, a, a something filled out. I'm talking about costs in terms of your, how much your house is going to sell for. Fly in the face of attitudes held by many Vermonters, left, right, and center. Already, this proposed mandate has provoked ugly attacks on the mayor, referring to her as, quote, the self-appointed energy czar, which I don't believe for a moment. The, the false comparisons that have been used by proponents Rather than objectively considering the pros and cons of a mandate, some proponents have dismissed objections to it out of hand with patently misleading comparisons to national seatbelt laws. Again, I could show you verse in, chapter and verse about why that is not a, an apt comparison. And then unsupported claims, and this is the, the pre previous speaker who was talking about the statistical uh, uh, requirements of, of a study. Proponents have defended the mandatory nature of this ordinance by claiming without citations, quote, we've seen from decades of evidence of voluntary climate measures, they do not work. Now, while it may be true that voluntary efforts by themselves are insufficient for the climate emergency we're facing, they have certainly already played an important role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions across the country. How else explain the myriad homeowners who have installed expensive solar panels on their roofs, paid for energy audits, blown in insulation, installed energy efficient windows, bought heat pump hot water systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Evidently, financial incentives and good intentions do work, at least for those who can afford to make such energy improvements. And there's the rub. This mandate will fall heavily on those who cannot afford to make such improvements. So now we have two weeks to the scheduled second reading, third public um, hearing of this ordinance. I sincerely hope that the City Council and its Energy Advisory Committee will use that time to reconsider the wisdom of moving forward with this ordinance without being certain that the many, many concerns being raised have been truly and impartially addressed. And I emphasize impartially. My own recommendation would be that this particular home energy labeling ordinance be withdrawn from consideration, that its consumer protection goals be left to more appropriate state and federal bodies, and that the city council pursue its laudable energy goals for Montpelier in more promising and equitable ways perhaps including some ideas that I and others have proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, other comments? Okay, I don't see anyone else. Um, so I'm gonna give it, give it another five seconds here. Would anybody else like to speak? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, this is all. Th this is actually uh, helpful. Um, it's uh, good to know, like what uh, what the concerns are. Um, so uh, we are going to take all of that into account. Um, so thank you. Um, all right. So um, from here, um, I'm going to close. Well, actually, I guess I'll close the public hearing. Um, would there is there a potentially a motion to um, schedule another reading um, for next time? Go ahead, Jack. 
I move that we schedule another public hearing, which will be the third public hearing at uh, at our next regularly scheduled meeting, which I think is May 12th. Second. Great. All right, so there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Oh, uh, sorry, hang on. Peter, did you have anything else you wanna say? I, I have a question. Okay, go Jack, ahead. Jack, do you intend to say that the vote will occur in the same meeting as was originally proposed? Or would you in, entertain an amendment that has been suggested by some other comments here that a pause be taken between a, a public reading of a revised version, which hopefully will get a red line version of before the meeting, but still that's not enough. I mean, having a vote immediately after a, 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 a second reading strikes me and others as be, really rushing something, a very high stakes in, uh, ordinance, very high stakes. Madam Mayor, would you, you like me to respond? Sure. Um, you can if you'd like. Thank you. Um, I, given that this is more than a year in the making, I don't believe that this has been rushed. On the other hand, I, I also uh, am confident that if there's a significant degree of public comment uh, at our next meeting that says uh, people haven't had a chance to adequately uh, absorb and understand the proposal, that people need more time with it. I would not anticipate the members of this council uh, rushing to vote while people uh, seriously think that more time is, is needed uh, to debate it. <coughs> Donna, go ahead. Uh, likewise, uh, adding to Jack's comment, I, I don't think it's appropriate. We've had, whenever we have hearings, first, second, we may decide on a third. I think it's more appropriate for the council to decide at each hearing whether we need more and not to try to sub guess us ahead of time. So you, you may be right, Peter, we may be total agreement when we hear the revisions and need more time, but I think it's up to the council to decide at that time and not make an advanced decision today. And I would, um, I would agree that there's precedent for uh, us uh, taking, or, so you usually don't schedule the vote um, together with the public hearing. Um, if we think it's appropriate to take a vote, then we usually do, but sometimes when we feel that that is not appropriate, then we schedule another hearing. Um, that has been our process in the past. Um, so hopefully that clarifies it. Um, so there is a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed? Okay. So the motion passes. Um, thank you. Um, that is... Um, it's good to know. So we are going to move on then to uh, to the pool option, uh, opening options. Um, so for this, I think it's probably uh, either Cameron or Arnie or both. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us back for the uh, second uh, presentation of our, our thoughts here. Um, you had asked us to come back with a couple of options because we, you know, everybody would like to see the pool open. I'm certainly no different. I would love to see the pool. I just want to make sure that we can keep it safe for everybody. Um, so, um, Cameron or Mary, can you put up the, um, the presentation on your screen for me? And we'll go through the, uh, we'll go through our, slide presentation here. So we're, we want to talk about a couple of options that we've come up with with some different ideas on on how we can make this, um, you know, equitable um, for the public and also for day camp. Um, option one is amending pool hours, separate day camp and the public by times. Um, option two, physically barricading off public access to a quarter of the pool and the pool house. This will separate day camp from the public physically. Um, B 
These two options have some similarities, pool opening timeline um, changes, waiver form requirements, temporary user fee changes for the 2021 season, and then masks and distancing. Next slide. Uh, so timelines for updates, the new uh, timeline for the 2021 season. Um, goal is to get the pool open by the first week of July, exact date to be determined. Um, pool closing um, around August 22nd, which is typical of every year because generally our staff is going back to school, to college or back to teach. So we kind of lose all our, all our guards at that point. And also some of the younger guards that are still in high school are participating in fall sports. So that's, that's why we end up having to do that. Uh, waiver form requirements. I've been talking a little bit with an, another pool that, you know, um, all pool passenger, passive purchasers will need to sign a waiver that acknowledges that, that they will not hold the city, they will hold the city harmless in case of a COVID outbreak. Um, swimming les lessons will also require a waiver. And then we'll also have waivers will be posted as a flyer poster at the entrance to the pool. So paying to enter the pool assumes agreement with the waiver. We just really want to make sure people are aware, um, you know, that we can't guarantee 100% protection from COVID. Um, next slide. So these were some suggested uh, fee changes for this year, um, and it would only affect um, daily fees. It would not affect uh, swimming pool season passes. So those will re remain the same as last um, the last time we were open, as well as swim lessons. Those will remain the same as well. So the the fees were just increased a little bit um, to help with some of the some of the costs for a challenging COVID year. <clears throat> suggestions for some of the safe guidance. Um, Vermont Ford plan requirements effective July 4th, 2021. Uh, no state gathering limit is anticipated. Uh, universal guidance will no longer be mandatory, but strongly encouraged. Uh, municipalities still have the option to enforce stricter guidance. So we will, um, staff recommends requiring all pool visitors to be masked when not actively in the water and to remain six feet or more away from anyone not in their group. So, the, uh, so explore an option one, changing hours. The current pool hours, this is what we've typically done in past years, uh, morning lap swim from seven to eight, general swim, then family swim, and then on the weekends, we had our, on both Saturday and Sunday, we we're open from one to 5.30. Um, however, day camp, which we want to prior towards the safety of runs Monday through Friday, 7.45 to 4.45. They do not use the pool that whole time. So I just want to be clear on that. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, okay. Nope. Um, no, we're good. Um, so exploring option one, uh, the recommended updates to the pool hours fully separate the public and the camp um, access by extending pool hours into the evening and remain in the same on weekends. So when camp's not there, you know, the, the whole facility would be available for the public. Um, so day camp, um, swimming lessons, just to be clear on this, um, Swimming lessons are typically 10 to noon. Uh, day camp when they swim in the pool is usually in the afternoon and that's usually from one to 3.30 um, is the typical time they would use it. So day camp would not have the full day to swim in the pool. It would just be in the afternoon. Um, general swim uh, slash family swim, uh, with a thought of being from 4.30 to 8 p.m. And then Saturdays and Sundays would be from one to 5.30. Again, that would be given the the, the space to the public after day camp was added there. So the public could use the whole facility. Exploring option one a little more, 
benefits of changing hours option, fully protects day camp from being impacted by a COVID outbreak at the pool facility and protects the public if day camp experiences an outbreak. Allows the public to fully use all pool facilities, including both rafts, um, the, the pavilion when day camp's done, because the pavilion is another day camp space during the day until 445, and then the pool house um, for check-in and restrooms. Uh, gives allowances for the anticipated lifeguard shortage if we have one, if we're lucky, we won't, as it requires marginal, marginally less lifeguard staffing. Um, drawbacks to changing hours option, less public swim hours during the day. So, you know, when most people really like to swim is when it's extremely hot. So that would be the, definitely the downside to this option. Um, okay, so this option includes barricade, barricading off portions of the pool um, and the, the whole of the pool. I can't read part of my slide because something's covering it. Okay, this option includes barricading off options of the pool and the whole of the pool house to the public to keep day camp participants distanced and safe. Um, other considerations, Porta Johns will be needed to replace pool house restrooms. One raft will be for day camp use only. And again, that's only while day camps at the pool. Then a quarter of the pool deck and pool would be day camp use only. Um, hours could be more flexible under this model, possibly requiring uh, more lifeguards during this time. So this is the um, demonstration of the possible pool configuration. So where you can see the red um, marked off there, that would be for the day camp use um, to keep day camp separate from the public. The green arrows is the entrance at the gate. That's a double gate entrance. So we could use that as the entrance for the public to come in and out of. Um, we could use the uh, windows on the side of the pool house and possibly in part of the front of the pool house, depending on how we section that off as a way for, um, to do uh, collecting money for walk-ins as well as um, pool concessions. If we wanted to try to sell ice cream and stuff, we could, we could set it up so we could pass ice cream through a window for, for the patrons at the pool. Um, then the yellow dots would be the location of Porta Johns. And the Porta Johns wouldn't be your standard unit. They would be the um, accessible units, which are much larger. So that way there, you don't feel like you're completely boxed in if you go into one. Um, so that was, that was some thoughts we had there. Um, exploring option two, physical barriers, some more. There will be a slight changes to the schedule, staffing dependent. Um, but will generally be similar to past years with the exception of lap swim, which will be moved to the afternoons. As I think we were looking at moving that from 12 to one. Uh, the pool entrance would be the side gate in this option, allowing folks to check in, pay and buy snacks through the windows of the pool house. Uh, benefits to the physical barriers option allows for more hours for public swim, all groups can use the pool at the same time with safety in mind. The drawbacks to the physical barriers option that blocks the public from using uh, most of the public facilities, including one raft, um, the pavilion until 445, which is normal during the summer because that's a day camp space, um, and the pool house uh, for check-in and restrooms. Requires a higher presence of lifeguards, which may again, may not be available, but we may, we may do okay. So we've already had people reach it out. Um, and then the cost of Porta Johns um, would be in there as well. Um, new April 23rd changes to summer camp guidance, new guidance information from ACCD suspends the requirement for separate restrooms from day camp attendees. However, the CDC is recommending that programs stagger use of shared spaces by reducing group size in the area at one time or remaining in cohorted groups while sanitizing shared objects and high touch surfaces. 
um, between groups and that preventative behaviors such as wearing a mask, hand washing and cohorting are needed. Additionally, CDC guidance still states that childcare programs might need to implement short-term building closure procedures if an infected person has been at the facility during their infectious period. The state will need to determine if Montpelier's programs close in consultation with the Department of Health. So we would, we would reach out to the Department of Health and they would guide us on what we, what we need to do um, due to a COVID situation. Um, due to staffing availability and highest safety priorities for children in mind, the, still, the city still recommends separating the pool house in this option. Uh, lifeguards, um, there, there is a, still a concern about availability, but again, you know, if, if people have been reaching out to me just recently, so I have some faith that you know, there are people out there that are ready to jump on board. Um, working with the Red Cross to talk about setting up a training. Um, and we'll have training days set up for staff. Um, CPR is now taught as a breathless technique, compressions only. Uh, swim lesson availability hinges on any of the hired lifeguards um, that are actually a water safety instructor. So we can provide a course for them to make sure we have at least a couple of guards that have that course. Uh, community benchmarking, the Barry City Pool. Uh, Barry is open in their pool under normal conditions and following your universal safety guidance uh, from the governor. They do not operate a day camp at their location. Uh, they reported they may have to change their operating hours due to low staffing and availability. So again, a lot of us are dependent on lifeguards on how, how we can open our pools and, and hopefully it won't be like two or three years ago when, when lifeguards were a real struggle to find. So I'm hoping that's not the case this year. Um, the Waterbury pool, uh, the rec director has staff who can actually help us train our guards. So I'm gonna set up a course with him and they're also gonna give us a bulk rate. That's something we've done with them before in the past. Uh, they are capping their pool limits to 80 people in their pool at a time and section and off sections of the pool to limit exposure, requiring reservations for swim lanes. Um, space and swimming lessons. So there are 15 minutes between lessons. In the past, I guess, they just literally had them overlapping. So with COVID, they've decided to space them this year. Um, they'll be requiring contact tracing through information forms um, for non-pool members. Uh, their camp is also not licensed, or their camp is not licensed. So they do have a day camp, but it's, it's not a licensed program. Um, the Summer Matters Grant Program, uh, both, both myself and Cameron have attended this training session for the grant on 420, the timeline um, it's due on May 5th, uh, the award notifications May 26th, and then the period of um, uh, award period is June 14th through September 15th, 2021. Uh, it is a reimbursement program, um, not upfront costs. The minimum request is $20,000, which really isn't hard to spend if we can get that grant. Um, with 1.5 million available for the whole state. The city aims to apply for increased funding for lifeguards and their training, but the opening of the pool does not rely on this funding. So, child license requirements, the day camp as a licensed child care provider follows rules separate from the Vermont Forward or Universal Guidance Plan. These rules have been recently updated effective May 1st, but are always subject to change. Uh, these plans are options and can be modified as needed throughout the summer season as COVID statistics change, as guidance is updated, or as council recommends. The financial considerations of either option are, are not really much different. Um, I think option two just allows for a little more pool hours um, to use the pool. And that's, that's where your differences in cost is 
is the uh, additional staff cost estimate, as well as the uh, portage on estimate. So that's pretty much the difference in the cost between there. The other startup expenses are, are typical from year to year. And then as a option three, as a non-recommended option, council could also decide to open the pool with its regular hours and no other safety considerations outside of the recommended waivers, masks, and distancing. Anybody have questions, thoughts? Yeah, thank you. If you could stop sharing your screen there. Great, I think I saw a hand from uh, Dan, but also Jay um, and Donna and Jack. And so we'll go in that order roughly. Okay, go ahead, Dan. Sure, almost sounded like you were starting a romper room kind of thing. Um, <laughs> Arnie and, and Cameron, First of all, I want to thank you for this presentation. Um, I'm really impressed in that you took the feedback we gave you last time and came back with um, just a really nice and robust plan. And I, I want to thank you both for the work that went into this, understanding that you have a lot of duties on your plate. And um, I really appreciate your incorporating our feedback into, into these and, and the thought and work that went behind it. Um, the one question that I have, um, because I'm sure there's a number of other city councilors that have other questions, is um, in regards to the swim team, where, where would that fit into um, either of the options? I actually had thought um, on option one, I was trying to get them in there between 3.30 and 4.30 which is the, which, which would be the option one plan, which did change, um, you know, that was the separation of the uh, public from day camp. And then the option two, I had them from their usual, la um, the last time they used the pool, I, I believe it was from seven to 8 p.m. is when they, so that's what I had them planned in there for. Although I think they mentioned they started at 6.30, but I don't remember them starting at 6.30, so. We'll have to get that sorted out. Um, but yeah, I did have a space for them um, to use in each of the options. Okay. I, I seem to remember there being a blurring of the end of the open swim in a couple of times where I was suddenly caught up in a swirl of uh, kids doing laps around the pool. So um, they, may have, they may have jumped the gun a few times, um, but, uh, or not. Um, Okay, uh, and is there any option uh, as far as volunteers to help out with either lifeguarding or you know doing swim team work? I know I've heard from a number of parents and individuals that are really interested in supporting this, um, and particularly given your concerns about um, having enough. Uh, lifeguards and others um, that is that a viable is that a workable option to it, incorporate that in it could be as long as they're a certified lifeguard so we we can't have people that are, aren't trained as a lifeguard to to actually you know sit sure. on or anything so yeah if they wanted to that way we could okay thank Arnie, you we'd be able to get um, volunteers training with the folks that we're hiring for um, lifeguards as well correct I would, I would think that if, if somebody wanted to volunteer their time, then it would be worth it to us to, you know, pay for their training as well. And, and maybe that might be another cost that we could seek the grant funding for if um, that additional training. Um, and it, it also strikes me too that, and you probably already thought of this, but, you know, if we do go with option two, where you're going to incur like uh, the porta potty expense and such, that, that that would be grant funding um, or you know targeted for grant funding as well. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Jay. Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly echo uh, uh, Dan and thank Arnie and Cameron for, for um, putting, putting these very you know, sensible alternatives together on a pretty short timeline. Um, 
I had a similar question um, about the team, but appreciate that, Arnie, you've given some thought to where they might fit in with that schedule. The, the one question I do have is, uh, just like I know you guys had to deal with um, changing um, changing guidance last Friday and had to update the presentation on Monday morning um, to this, I'm curious if, if Cameron and Arnie, if you have any thoughts um, uh, around which of these two alternatives might provide you the most flexibility moving forward between now and opening in early July, if um, things, if, if the governor, if, if, you know, the governor loosens things up more or if things tighten up more, I either direction, which one do you think will give us the most, um, that will still achieve the goals, but then will give us, give you all the most, the most flexibility to make it happen? Thanks. Um. I'll jump in first. Um, my thought is option two. I think, you know, the separation does create a little bit more safety cushion, I think. That's just my thought process. Um, one of the things I was looking at in the um, another uh, thing that came out on the COVID-19 health guidance for child care is, and this is, this is what plays a big part for me. Um, unvaccinated staff or children who have been identified as a close contact must quarantine. So if we have a biggest portion of our group um, for our child care will not be vaccinated. So if somebody comes into close contact with that group, we could have 20, 30 kids possibly that have to quarantine at a day camp for 14 days, um, which would be a huge, huge hit on our, you know, on our revenue for that program. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that's still playing into me on this is, you know, and for the safety of, again, the unvaccinated population um, is gonna be. Right. So I'll let Cameron add to that. Well, to build on what Arnie said, you know, we spent a good amount of time going over these options um, and really what, we thought they were both good options, but what would we be like actively recommending to y'all? And I think that would be option two because if things are loosened up, if children can get vaccinated more, we could take those barriers down very quickly and it keeps the hours to the pool as close to what people are accustomed to anyway, um, while allowing for uh, a measure of real distancing between what the kids in daycare are using and what the public is using. Um, it will be an inconvenience, I think, for a lot of folks, but I, I think at this point, we're all sort of used to inconvenience in the year and a half of COVID. So. Um, but we also, and just sort of to drive home a point that Arnie just mentioned, is really trying to take the safety of the children in, in, who are participating, not only just as guests to the pool, but also in our day camp where a lot of folks in the community rely on for summer daycare um, so that they can go to work is protected, um, which is why also we'd be recommending that folks still wear masks when they're not actively swimming and stay distanced um, and in their own family pods. We know that the governor's um, guidance, like you just said, Jay, is changing really rapidly and that won't be in place, but municipalities have still been given the power to make those um, guidance and those recommendations on their own. And we think that that's really important just for the safety of the youth who use the pool. Thank you. And that would also include the kids that are there for swimming lessons. So we got to keep them in mind that they too are under that age group. I just want to jump in here and say that I'm glad that you're wrecking, recommending option two because that was my um, preference as well. Um, Donna, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, me too. I, I like keeping the hours as close as possible. And I think as you both mentioned, option two gives you a platform if you have to get more severe or more open. I was um, wondering about what happened to the pool repairs? Are they going to be gotten before the season or after the season some some of them will be before the season as far as like repainting the pool itself um and also painting the uh pool house we're going to try to do as much touching up of that as we can um because being our licensed facility we can't have paint falling off that building um mm. so we have to make sure that that that's not happening um but as far as like doing the outer rim of the the pool deck with the um having that sealed and stuff i'm a little concerned doing that before the season because that 
tar or whatever material they use might like run into the water. It may not absorb enough into the pavement. Um, so I'd be concerned that, you know, we might get some runoff from that type of material. So will the bathrooms in the pool house be working, especially on the women girl side? They're working. Um, they're not fancy. We tried to get a grant, as you know, for that to renovate the pool bathrooms. And unfortunately, we didn't get the grant. Um, we are going to reapply for that again in, in the um, next cycle. Um, but if we don't get it, I think we just have to look at going forward and trying to renovate some bathrooms. Well, I mean, that's the other thing about two. I really think you need the porty pots anyway. So I think that also might be a place where you could use volunteers. If we choose option two and you have a separate gate, Perhaps you could use volunteers that aren't swim, you know, certified, but could help you with emissions hmm. as far as that flow um, out there. Uh, so I, I was going to ask you to expand public hours for option one, but you explained the swim team is taking that hour up. So uh, I won't. The other thing I had a question about was the number of kids. You're not really talking about limits unless I missed it, you didn't mention any limits here. And I know you have a lot of camp kids. I mean, I've seen them and the shelter there. They're, they're really um, quite a large number. Do you have an idea what you're expecting for them and to be in the pool from the public side? Um, our license allows us up to 120 kids in day camp. Wow. Um, that's what our license allows right now. Um, I have the limit set a little bit lower because of the COVID regulations and we're trying to, we're, we're trying to be practical on that. Um, so right now that it, we've got lowered to below a hundred um, for campers, but we also have another site that we could probably use, but with the pool open, nobody's gonna wanna be at that other site. <laughs> so they'll wanna be where they can swim. <laughs> so right now, I think I have it set for like 88 kids a day. We might go up a little bit depending on the guidelines, but again, the goal would be to keep, you know, similar groups of kids together like they did in school. So we don't have a, a complete changeover of kids. A lot of, a lot of kids that participate in our summer camp will be there for most of the summer. So. So then you feel you don't have to limit who comes on the public side or are you beyond our, in? not beyond the uh, capacity of the pool itself, like our, you know, the fire marshal capacity for the space, which I couldn't tell you offhand. Arnie, do you know? Okay. Okay. I, I don't know offhand, but some of the things Cameron and I had talked about because we uh, was trying to section off areas of the pool to try to create some of that six foot distancing. Um, right. To help people keep themselves in groups. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So so we're, we're going to try to figure out how we can do that to make it functional and not so people are tripping over stuff. Right. Oh. And once we have sort of direction from y'all in which, you know, way you want to go, we'll be able to refine that and, and how it actually works. Um, I think, you know, um, Donna, to get to your point, I think um, if there are an influx of children and, and we are a little larger, we could move the barriers for more space for the public, less space for day camp, that, or more space for day camp, less space for the public. Like those things can be worked out throughout the summer as, as guidance changes or, or things just change. So it does allow us to be pretty flexible. Well, thank you. This was really understandable. I, I really appreciate all the planning. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm trying to remember who is next. It was either Connor or Jack. <laughs> we'll go just in that order, Connor, then Jack. I just echo everybody else. First of all, it's um, asking city staff to do business as usual. I think is asking like a lot these days, you know, with the year we've had and everything. Uh, so to have a presentation with both these options, which are well, well thought out, you know, um, very grateful for the work that's gone on to it. Um, so thanks very much. I, I'd, uh, I tend to favor option two, I think, you know, just as we're looking at flexibility, um, you know, I, I, I think you have parents who are working all hours here and to, to limit it to the, you know, latter part of the day there. Um, I, I think you could have some kids missing out on that. So again, to have as many hours as possible, I think is key because we, we're doing it for for kids, right? It's they've had a they've had a hell of a year here, um, and I think to get them out, it's going to be great for their mental health here, um, and it, it's just going to be good for the the buzz of the town there. So I'd certainly favor option two, but um, 
you know, I can barely dog paddle, so not married to it if people go another <laughs> direction. So thanks so much though. Seriously, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, before you go, Jack, I just want to recognize that it is 8.30. Jack, do you, can, do you think you can remember and hang on to your comments? Excellent. Yes, we're committed to doing the break. Let's do That's it. That's right. We are committed to the break. Uh, so uh, let's take, uh, we're going to take 10 minutes. So we'll see you back at 8.40, and we'll start with Jack, and we'll go from there. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, I, I was sort of doing a review of what cultural uh, Central Vermont cultural uh, phenomena I've missed out on. And one of them is uh, is Thunder Road. I've never been there. Um, and another one is that my family was never uh, a regular at the uh, at the Montpelier pool. So um, I wonder, Arnie, if you have an idea of uh, uh, statistics of usage by uh, by time of day the um your busier times a day are probably the middle of the afternoon like um during the one to three o'clock time generally tends to be a lot of day campers and there are a few families and um, child care groups that come during that time then you have more of your families that do show up um, a little bit later than that. But it seems to get really quiet typically around seven o'clock. And that's why we let the swim team use it at seven, because we'd have like one or two swimmers after seven o'clock. That's kind of been the, the history there. And then, of course, weekends are usually quite busy. Um, and then what really pushes it, of course, is the weather. If it's 90 degrees, it doesn't matter what time of day, we're usually busy. Mm -hmm. um, so the weather is the biggest driving force for us for the pool. Yeah, in, in the town I grew up in, the evening hours for the pool were dependent on the, uh, on the temperature humidity index. And it had to be above a certain level in order for them to think it was worth opening the pool uh, after six o'clock or something like that. Uh, I, my immediate thought is that it seems like it would be significantly harder to manage the uh, uh, pr option number two, and that it, it really struck me that uh, the, the temporal separation plan, option number one, would, would be easier for, the, uh, for you to manage. But you know, as Connor said, I'm not uh, married to that idea, and, and I certainly have no problem with uh, with going with the uh, with the option that you support and which the majority of the council supports. And that's okay. all I've got in. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, any other comments from uh, Cal oh, Yes, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, just, just briefly, because I think everything pretty much has been said, um, just wanted to echo the gratitude for pulling together these options. Um, and yeah, I mean, to me, I think option two, even just because it would require um, lining up the porta potties and the equipment for the barriers and stuff, it makes sense to plan on that. Um, you could always do the temporal later if it, you know, we needed to tighten down or if, you know, you come back to us and had um, but having just the equipment to pull off um, option two seems to give us the most flexibility to respond to kind of conditions as they're happening. Um, and I, you know, love the idea of having more time for people to have access to the pool if we can make that work um, and really appreciate again all the thought that went into it. Great. Um, I am guessing that we have some members of the public here who would like to uh, potentially comment. So if you would like to make a comment, now would be a good time. Um, you can either physically like turn your camera on and wave, or you can use the raise hand uh, feature uh, in under reactions, or you can, um, if you're on a phone, you can uh, just unmute yourself and let us know that you want to speak.
Donna, do you have something? Well, just that I think the public was really good in reaching out to us. I mean, I had like four calls before I got back from the Cape about this issue. And I've heard from at least four to five more just this last week. So I think they definitely want the pool open and as maximum as possible to the regular hours. And one thing is that the kids in the afternoon come without their parents on their bikes walking. And it's a really good opportunity for kids to have independence. And also it just, it's a great break for the household. So I would love to see us do option two and would like to make that motion that we impl ask the staff to implement their option two and that they'll keep us posted to do whatever we can to support them in this effort. Okay, so uh, there's a motion in a second and I, um, I see there Alicia um, that you may want to comment. I just wanna make sure that I've noted that there's a motion in a second with Dan seconding there. Um, so Alicia, go ahead. Am I unmuted? Can you, can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Okay, super. <laughs> um, so I just popped on to listen to this section and, and see what was being pr proposed. And uh, I, I, I can clearly see that it looks like the council's headed in a certain direction. I just wanted to say thank you to the, the pool director um, for pointing out the, the option, the unrecommended option that it would be okay to just, that the city council could go ahead and approve to open the pool with, with a limited, uh, you know, the, the very least limitations. Um, and I think that that's awesome that, that he went ahead and put that out there and that my family is, is super in support of that. We have a lot of friends in other states that um, didn't experience the level of mask mandates and shutdown that Vermont has experienced and were able to go ahead and, and, and swim and interact and uh, everybody's fine. So I just, I just wanted to voice that and that we are, we are, our family, you know, would be, would be definitely in favor of that option. But like I said, uh, sounds like, sounds like there's a di different direction that's going, but I wanted to, to, um, to really say thank you that that, that was put out there as an option and to hear that the city council does in fact have the um, the power to go ahead and approve that. So thank, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Just, uh, I think it's clear that uh, if the uh, standards from the Centers for Disease Control or uh, the uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development change to loosen restrictions that it would be within the uh, discretion of the, of the department to do that, regardless of what we're approving. Can I just toss in too that it's easy to kind of forget this and just another reminder that we are also running a daycare at this site and that is different from most other pools. And so we've got two distinct groups that need to be kept safe and and you know a daycare group people are signing up to watch their kids while they they work and, and while I certainly you know my I had four kids they all went to the pool we were pool regulars I didn't know how great the pool was but if you shut down the daycare then you got a bunch of families that just lost their option while they're trying to work and um, so there is a distinction between the Montpelier pool and and other pools I just wanted to remind everyone that that's driving the recommendations. Um, we're gonna go uh, Peter and then Dan. Oh, thank you. I just had a quick question. Um, because of the year we had, the schools are actually um, ending this season, um, I think it's June 11th. So I didn't know, and this is a question for Arnie and the rec center with the daycare program and the pool. Um, Will there be um, any consideration of opening the pool and the facilities earlier than the first week of July, being that the kids will be out of school, you know, the first weekend will be the weekend of the 12th um, of June that, you know, they'll be um, out of session. So that was, that was my only question. And again, just thanks for 
um, listening to the public last meeting and um, moving forward with this proposal it was really good to hear. I guess to, just to answer that question, Peter, with our timeline um, and how much work that has to be done to get that pool ready, I think this is probably the earliest. If we get lucky and get it a week sooner than July 1st, I think we'd be very fortunate. Um, but there's a lot that goes into uh, preparing this pool um, just to open it. Thanks, uh, Dan. I'll, I'll just be quick. I mean, I think option two, as everyone said, preserves the best option, the best sort of middle road with all the competing sort of stakeholders, whether it be the child care, the general public, swim lessons, and swim team. Everybody gets as close to normal as possible with protections in place. And obviously, if things change, if they loosen up or they tighten up, tighten up, you know, we. <clears throat> we understand, I understand at least, you know, your need to adjust. And certainly any approval that I give tonight is, comes with that understanding uh, of the need to adjust as, as things either loosen up or tighten up. And so, again, it, it's something I think this is really uh, a workable plan. And, and I think option two is the best for that, uh, for that reason. So. Okay. Uh, so I think we we do have a motion and a second. Uh, is there any further discussion on this topic? We're moving towards. Well, it's the motion is to go with option two. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So that passes. Thank you for your work on this. We are all very appreciative um, of it. Yeah, thank you. All right, so, and the next uh, item, this is where we were switching something. Uh, so we're moving on to the strategic plan update. Uh, yeah, or the COVID-19, whichever one. Cameron, do you feel like doing both of them or you wanna skip one? I can, I can do both. Um, I think the COVID one has a little less conversation, I think, but I'm fine with running through them all. No worries. Okay. I am met. I have medicine. I'm here. Um, ready to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let me share my screen here real quick. So I've got a presentation for you that goes along with the report you were given, the full report that explains sort of where we're at with the strategic plan um, for this year. We are now in quarter three. So just as a reminder, the strategic goals that are included in the council's strategic plan are community prosperity, COVID-9 response, environmental stewardship, getting more housing, responsive and responsible government and sustainable infrastructure. Right now, uh, we are a little behind. Uh, I think you remember last time in quarter two, we had a 45% progress bar. You can see this, this quarter, we have far more projects on delay. Um, you'll see more detail in the full report, but more, a majority of these delays are COVID-19 related. We are continuing to see sort of a domino effect on um, COVID delays. So a lot of the delays are on larger projects. Most of them are DPW infrastructure projects because they can't move forward. They're sort of at an impasse. And so we are behind on our completion goal, but I'm not um, super, con I, I mean, I, I can speak for myself looking at the strategic, strategic plan. I'm not very concerned because we know why they're delayed. We're not running into staffing issues. We're not running into capacity issues. We're running into purely almost bureaucratic issues in the face of COVID-19. So um, there are a little bit more details, but we'll get into each um, project that's included in your strategic plan in this presentation. If my computer will work, questionable at best. There we go. So we're gonna get into the uh, initiatives that support your goals. So for community prosperity, we have an initiative around our budget processes that is um, doing well and is on target. The budget was adopted. The budget passed with 84% of our voters. The budget was um, submitted to council with a baseline survey for community engagement, which we intend to build out in the next year's budget process. 
So we've already started working on our fiscal year 23 budget process. I think um, Kelly has kept y'all pretty well abreast of what's going on. She's also been giving y'all quarterly updates on our budget. Um, so I believe she's given you the third quarter and is working on the fourth quarter. And we are still in our fiscal year 21 deficit mitigation plan, which is still working as intended. So as far as COVID-19 response, we are on track with both of our initiatives. The city has, um, all, I'm just going to present your reopening plans for how um, the city facilities will open tonight, right after this, in alignment with the state's Vermont Forward plan. And we have been supporting CAN and um, how they've been looking for funding um, from other organizations. So we've been supporting them in that work. Uh, we do have some um, updates in the MDC and Montpelier Alive Partnership Initiative. MDC has announced to y'all that it is dissolving. And so we will be recommending economic development structure recommendations at the next council meeting. So MDC is currently providing grants for startup businesses and Montpelier, Montpelier Alive is planning for loosened restrictions for retail restaurants and public gatherings. Uh, the identified issue on this one though, and it will be coming, becoming a larger issue, and I think Bill will get into that next council meeting, is that there's no current funding for economic development in the city budget. So environmental stewardship, your initiatives there, net zero 2030 plans are on track. The city went out for RFP for developing a net zero plan and has hired the consulting firm VEIC to implement the plan on the city's behalf. So they're currently building that out. The stormwater master plan is one of the plans that is in delay right now. There's no internal capacity um, because there needs to be an external contractor that needs to be engaged. And so we are working on getting that external contractor and there's no timeline on that right now. So um, we have done our internal planning and DPW has worked that out. We just need to find a, um, a, an available contractor to work for us and the funding to pay for them. So for the goal for more housing, the initiative to implement the city plan housing initiatives is going well, it's on track. The housing task force is meeting to discuss new programs and project options for the upcoming budget year. The city has continued to issue first time home buyer awards and has continued the ADU program and has developed preliminary information on MAP. The city staff continues to work with developers on two potential housing projects and zoning updates to remove barriers for additional housing were approved by city council. So that is on track. Jack, I'm sorry, I, I caught your hand. Um, could you explain the uh initialisms of ADU and MAPA, please. I wish I knew MAPA. I wish Mike was still here so I could explain that one a little further. Um, ADU is an accessory dwelling unit and I knew what MAPA meant until you asked me what it meant. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I admit, I don't know it either, but yeah. I do. Oh, hey, Bill. come on. It's the uh, Municipal uh, Administrative Procedures Act. So it would allow so the way that works is um, DRB would actually hear, hear uh, applications on the record. People would be sworn in. There would be, you know, formal testimony. And so instead of it being de novo, an appeal de novo, it would only be, it would be appealed on the record for what it was heard at DRB. So the theory is something, there's a little bit more upfront work at the local level, but it can streamline some of the appeals because you don't get to start all over fighting everything all over. You know, um, and so they're they're evaluating whether it's worth doing for all applications or just you know setting a threshold above which you know. So anyway, um, and I think I actually just spoke at length with Mike today. That's why I'm so knowledgeable about this. And uh, we're talking about maybe having it as an upcoming agenda item with DRB and Planning Commission and some you know doing a little workshop meeting with everyone to see what we think about proceeding. Great. That's what that's a long answer to what MAPA means. No, that, that's great because uh, people at home watching don't necessarily even know what they should care about until they hear it, get a little more content. 
That is fair, and that is a good feedback, and I'll make sure to spell those things out in these presentations in the future. So thank you. I think yeah. you reminders on that often, but you get in your own headspace when you're writing these things, these things out and forget. So thank you. So your goal for responsive and responsible government, um, your lobbying subcommittee has been meeting and has met with the delegation is on track. And the child care option study is another thing that is currently um, on pause. We are currently working with Breadloaf, who did the initial design for the renovation of the um, rec center to, and we've asked them to sort of look at what it would cost and what it would look like to build a new building entirely out by the rec fields. And what would that look like if we wanted it to have infant care or child care in a larger capacity? Um, you know, I'm going to call out an employee that no longer works for us, but um, we did have a new program manager in our rec department. His name was Nick, and he had some really innovative ideas. And one of them was, um, if you're going to bond for $5 million, why not ask for a new building? And I didn't really have a good answer, so we figured we would ask. And so that's sort of where we're at, because right now the answer to council on that child care option study is that we don't have facilities that would legally allow us to have infant child care. There's no way to renovate the rec center um, in a way that we could afford to make it appropriate for infant child care. So we are um, asking for cost and impacts studies from Bread Loaf right now, and that should be coming to us around June. So we'll have more information moving there. Um, you know, we had, uh, y'all had tabled the bond question for a while because our community is not really ready for a $5 million bond in the wake of COVID. So we took this as an opportunity to maybe look at other options. So that is moving in a different direction, um, but it is still on hold because technically we don't have an answer for you yet in its totality. So, um, and then your goal for sustainable infrastructure and protecting, maintaining and improving our built infrastructure. It's got lots of different moving parts. So I've sort of split out what is on delay and what is on track. Overall, it is on track. A good majority of the things that um, DPW has on this initiative has been completed, which is great. Um, there are some other things that need to be, oh, sorry, that need to be finished, including the Granite Street sidewalk repairs. The state is currently reviewing that contract. There is a major disruption in the Grant Road Bridge. We are planning on submitting for grant applications to start raising funds to narrow the funding gap for that bridge repair. And then the Moat property project has been delayed, but the contractors say they are ready for spring 2021. So again, that gets back to contractor availability, which has been a, a pretty substantial barrier for a lot of the progress in these um, initiatives. So I'm gonna pause there um, and try to see if anyone has any questions. I can't see everyone, so, um, okay. Love the potential for new new building that incorporates lots of childcare. It's great. Thank you. I, I, I figured that would go, that would be a, a welcome uh, yeah. conversation. So um, I also just wanted to make note that um, this would be another time that the public dashboard is updated. So after this report is given to y'all and I am good to return to work, I will be updating the public dashboard so that when folks go to our homepage and click on our dashboard, you will be able to see all of the progress that we've made on our quarter three um, updates for our strategic plan. Super. So that was my presentation on that. I didn't know if y'all had any further questions. Okay, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, just a comment. I was like an early critic of this sort of method. I was telling Bill, I thought it was some sort of witchcraft, but as it's gone on, you know, it's it's amazingly right. satisfying seeing the bars go to like 80% and that type. And, and I think it's really helpful when you like uh, look at the budget process. So just an idea that I didn't want to like get away. Um, I think it could be helpful for committees too, if they sort of voluntarily choose to look at their charge and kind of have a status report each year of what tangible things they delivered. I think that would help us, especially, you know, as we're looking at MDC disbanding, where does the money go to different groups like Montpelier Alive? Um, it actually might be helpful to have some data like this. Um, and yeah, hopefully not too much staff time, but if they could do it as a committee, maybe before budget season. Yeah. 
Yes. Thank you. I'm definitely going to put that on my resume is witchcraft. So, <laughs> um, I also wanted to make a note that um, while we focus in these reports on specific things that are in y'all's strategic plan, the city's staff also has far more initiatives that they're working on that support these goals. And so I think for the end of the court, like the fourth quarter, I'd like to give you this report and also the full report of what everything that the city has been doing so that you can see sort of what um, we've accomplished in that way as well. Um, just because I, I think that that gives a whole nother um, understanding of the work that they're doing to support some of these goals as well. So it'll be a really big report next next quarter. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was great, Cameron. Thank you. And I agree, it is fun to watch the, the bars change, progress. <laughs> it's uh, it's motivating. Well, I maybe not motivating. It's like, it's exciting. I definitely agree. Yeah. Aim for excitement here. <laughs> All right, are you uh, good for doing the COVID? Okay, great. All right, I don't have a presentation for this one, um, but you have received the draft plan um, that I put forward. So we worked really, really hard as staff to sort of determine where we were at with our internal planning, where our different departments were at, uh, what our staff capacity was, what our staff's vaccination status was for those who um, are electing to get vaccinated. And I think came up with um, a plan that not only protects our staff, but will protect the community as well from potential exposure with our staff. You have to know that even with limited um, limited open hours, uh, our staff still really works closely with the public and is with the public often. I think right now I'm a really good example of the fact that you can play everything right and still get very sick. So um, the executive summary of our opening plan is to comply with the Vermont Forward Plan we would stay closed to the public the way we are now until July 6th, at which point we would open full scale all of our facilities back to normal hours. Also, city facilities would be open for walk-in services at that date. Appointments would still be encouraged, of course, so we'd really like the public to make appointments for their safety and ours, but we would be open for walk-ins. Some facilities will require further accommodations, but that's really just the senior center because they serve a, um, uh, an at-risk population, the state has different guidelines for their opening. So this would not cover the senior center, but all other facilities. So the timeline that we're recommending to y'all is um, would allow both city staff to become fully vaccinated. And we think as many Vermonters as possible since that is the goal. So we'd be serving a vaccinated residents and our staff would be vaccinated as well. We would like masks and distancing to remain required in all city facilities, even after July 6th. And for the foreseeable future, honestly, I don't know. I don't have an answer for when we'd want to lift that. Um, that's certainly up to y'all. But you know, municipal, municipalities have that power, and I would recommend that we take that, um, just again, for safety. And um, the thing I think that's most important for y'all is city council meetings will need to return to fully in person when the state of emergency is lifted. That date is to be determined that we don't really know. I'm assuming July 15th, we might lift it earlier. Um, but council can choose to implement a hybrid in-person Zoom format starting on May 6th. So we do recommend that, well, my recommendation for y'all, you can do um, with this what you will, but would be to have y'all stay on Zoom and we would open city hall so folks from the public could come and participate. We'd have computers set up for people to participate, chairs that would be distanced until July 6th where we'd be able to open that up for everybody to be in person fully. Um, also, if folks wanted, if y'all wanted to come in individually, we could, we could accommodate that, um, but we would want to have city facilities or city hall anyway be open for in-person um, council meetings so folks can participate in person via Zoom in City Hall starting May 6th. And so council will be able to return to fully in-person meetings starting after July 6th when we'd be opening city facilities. So I could go in 
to more detail, but that is really the crux of what we're recommend recommending um, for the opening plan. Sorry, I'm like losing my voice as I'm speaking. Uh, Dan and then Jeff and then Donna. Mm -hmm. So just a quick question, when you're proposing uh, we go back into in-person in, in July, would that still, would that be masked? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, and would there be any other sort of like partitions or barriers or be just uh, normal? Well, we had thought about putting um, plexiglass between y'all's seats. Um, so it would just be sort of pending their ability to put that in. But if you would like that, we can do that for you. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't have strong feelings necessarily one way or the other because I've heard mixed, mixed things about that. Um, it seems like the mask would be the more important uh, of the two. Yes, the state actually, it's interesting because universal guidance for um, most everything is just please wear masks, please distance. But for public returning public meetings, they've asked that folks are, are checked in. So uh, the public who wants to come into the, um, to the city hall to participate in a council meeting, we need to sign in and uh, we have temperature checks there. Um, and that's the state has put that guidance out for us to follow. So it's a, it's a little stricter for um, meetings of a public body. So our committees would also need to follow that rule. Oh, that's that's interesting, right? That any any committees would have to do that as well. Um, mm -hmm. Just to follow up on that, I assume the temperature checks would be would need to be done by a staff member. It doesn't have to be. Um, that was specified in the guidance is you could ask folks to do that themselves at the door. Okay. Okay. Uh, we did, we did something similar with teachers uh, at the high school, um, self, self checking temperatures. Anyway, sorry, Jack, go ahead. No, that's, that's quite all right. Um, yeah. I, I was also wondering about the, uh, the physical arrangements. If we're talking about six foot separation, would we be, sitting in our usual uh, places or would we be moving to one of the possible physical arrangements that we talked about a year ago when we were considering how to proceed? Um, personally, you know, I, I like the idea of uh, just doing the meetings from, I can't believe I'm saying this, I like the idea of just doing the meetings from home until uh, July when uh, we're required to do it. Um, if I had a choice and if my preference would be to do plexiglass barriers between the members of the council and no masks, I don't know if that's mm. even uh, a possibility. Um, my, uh, my immediate pushback to that is if we're asking every, every member of the public and our staff to wear masks, we would, we would ask that y'all wear them inside the building as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I totally get that. Um, but, but it, as I said, that's my feeling at least on masked until people get into their plastic cubicle and then, but you know that's um, I I see that there's a, a valid point to not making other people follow restrictions that we're not uh, holding ourselves to um, let me check my notes but I think that might be Might be all I have for the moment. Thank you. Okay, Donna. Um, so uh, Cameron, just to go back to the temperature, when you first spoke about temperature, I thought you were talking about the public coming in, but you also mean everybody gets their temperature taken. And I assume mask even with petitions because that seems to be what CDC is emphasizing, mask everywhere. But I don't understand about committees. Would it would seem like committees still need to plan remote meetings for a while just because of the logistics or oh, do yes um yes so we're recommending that committees stay um on zoom until after july 6th but they if they come back and meet they're a, a member like it's a public meeting so they would also need 
after that time to follow the same guidance that y'all do for your, your meetings. So do, do they need then to go through you or somebody? Do they have to be, quote, committee approved to have live meetings that, that the city knows they've set up the right um, situation that follows yes. all these guidelines? Yes, we would ask them to do that after July. Okay. And, and is there anything that allows us to ask who's been vaccinated, who's not? No. So we have to assume that there are unvaccinated people in the room, which brings us back to mask, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we stated in the guidance that committees can operate in a similar fashion to council. Um, they can determine on their own if they want to meet in a hybrid fashion. We're recommending that they don't, but they can decide that after May 5th um, in the same way that y'all can if you want to, but they would need to reach out to us to make sure that the scheduling works and that they're in an ADA compliant room that allows for distancing. Uh, did I see hands from Oh, so Lauren and then Jay, did you have some uh, a hand up as well? No, okay. Uh, so we'll go Lauren and then Jack. Um, so just on this point of the committee meetings, like I know that there were changes around um, public meeting and access for like due to the state of emergency. Is there potentially going to be an option to keep doing remote meetings into the future? Like I think for a lot of committees that might end up being a more convenient Mm -hmm. option for uh, for some committees if it were an option is that going to take like legislative change or something at some it point would. it would vlct says that that's not going to be an option what we could do is much like what we're planning on doing after may 6 for y'all is a hybrid model where the staff member the staff support can be present in a room for members of the public who want to participate who cannot participate via zoom and I assume that will still be allowable. And that's my understanding of what they've written. And if that changes, I will let y'all know, but that's my understanding of what's written. And then, thank you. And then just one follow-up. So are, and then are you anticipating that after July 6th, when we are in person masked with or without plexiglass, like the, we're gonna still have a Zoom option. Is that what I'm understanding? So other people can still call in. Yeah. Um, I really would like to implement that and the, that would be my goal is to have a computer on the side where folks can zoom in and see what's happening um, because I think this has been really invaluable for a lot of folks who aren't able to leave their house or just want to drop in for one thing. Um, so I, I don't want to get rid of something that we really gained in this sort of new world and this new technology. So I'd really like to make that work. And then we'd always be able to turn to the Zoom screen in the room and ask if anyone had anything that they wanted to say. <clears throat> yeah, that's great. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. I, I remembered what I was going to say, which is that at, at where I work, we have uh, developed uh, an electronic uh, self-certification form for any employee who's going into the office and it includes self-certification of all uh, conditions, including uh, lack of a fever. And you know, given what I've seen or read and experienced about the uh, inaccuracy or questionable accuracy of the no-touch uh, thermometers, it might be might be just as good and less burdensome to ask people to certify that they don't have a fever or even to certify that they've taken their temperature and they don't have a fever rather than come in rather than have everyone be subjected to uh, one of those no touch uh, thermometers you know one time when I was going into the into my dentist uh, I was tested as having a uh, temperature of about 93 and it's pretty clear that that was not accurate because <laughs> I was still walking around and uh, doing everything else that living here. <laughs> the health screening form itself, um, if you click through to that, is a state health um, department form. And it really just says, uh, especially I agree with you, I don't think those handheld ones work very well. Um, that you basically self-report, do you have a fever or do you feel feverish? because like you said, those might not be available or accurate, but we will have one on, on hand. If people do answer yes to that question, we can check. Gotcha, thanks. 
<laughs> Other questions folks may have. Okay. Well, it is exciting to at least be having this conversation. <laughs> what does it look like to uh, get to a place where maybe we can be back in person, even if it means potentially with masks? Um, you know, there's one other possibility that I want to float out there, which is that uh, when we can go back to being in person, but let's say the requirement is that we wear masks, um, it's possible that some folks may, some of us may want to continue to participate remotely um, so that we don't have to wear masks. Um, is Anyway, I just want to open that up as a possibility, but then that person would also be participating by Zoom. We would include them the same way. Anyone have thoughts on, on that? I just wanted to put that out there as a possibility. Um, if not, that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. No, I guess the only thing I, I mean, there's an awkwardness and I think that's part of the reason why I would support not going back and until, or doing a hybrid model, um, but but staying home until July. Um, it, it just limits the participation. It's one thing if we're all on sort of the equal, but that said, I mean, if people have a strong feeling or a strong need I mean, we have the technology, we've proven it works. Um, I guess it would just be a matter of, of sort of working out some of the kinks, but, um, you know, it, I would favor sort of a, a general, not to be a peer pressure person, but I think it's, if we're all on the same platform, it, it makes the discourse easier. Yeah. Uh, I just want to point out are you are you saying Dan that if we waited until July then we wouldn't have to wear masks because I, I no I'm, no no I, okay I, I meant I meant just as 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 opposed to saying like right now some of us could go back and some okay, of us right. would gotcha. stay there that hybrid model I think Cameron said you know has, is out there but right. didn't recommend and I agree with that completely um, okay. for these reasons yep all right Jack any other thoughts on that I feel the same way the quality of the interaction is better if we're all on Zoom or all physically present. Yeah, okay. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we touched on that. Any other thoughts or comments on this reopening plan? Okay, thank you, thank you for all your work on this, Cameron. Uh, and I hope you go get some good rest. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so did you want to vote to approve this opening plan or? Sure. Um, make that, uh, I'll make the motion to approve your opening plan. Well you. done. <laughs> okay, there's a motion in a second uh, from Lauren and any further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? Okay, so that passes. Thank you again. And uh, go home. Yeah, all right. What's that? I, I am home. home. I am <laughs> home. I will go to bed now. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> All right. So our next Thank item. Yeah. Uh, our next item is the um, winter parking uh, uh, update or review. And I know that there are multiple members of the Department of Public Works here, uh, but I'll, I guess I'll start by turning it over. Uh, well, either to to Zach or to uh, Donna. So, um, Whoever. Do a quick intro. Yeah, go ahead. So just, just a reminder that, you know, this winter we tried a new um, parking system, uh, which we, uh, due to the great work of our DPW staff, created pretty quickly, late in the fall, and we, we, you know, we got a lot of work done. And so uh, the council had appropriately asked to do a debrief of this as well as just in general how the winter went, but I think specifically the parking, and to do it while it was still relatively fresh in our minds. I and mean, we did have snow last week, so I guess it's uh, <laughs> pretty fresh. But the the parking, the winter parking restriction season ended April 1st. So this is really only the second meeting since that ended. 
So hats off to DBW. They've put a lot of work together. And with that, uh, so that's why we're doing this. I'm going to turn it over to Donna and Zach and let them take it from there. So I'm not, I'm going to allow um, Zach to present um, the majority of the conversation tonight. He, he was the person who really identified um, this um, opportunity for us. I think we've had um, a lot of success with it. Um, there are definitely areas that we feel can be improved. Um, and, um, and it's getting late, so I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Zach. All right, thank you, Donna. Um, one second, I just need to share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So we're here tonight to talk about the winter debrief uh, from this past year about the changes uh, from the the alternate side parking uh, that we implemented. So tonight we're gonna first talk about uh, the winter weather in comparison from this year to the previous year. Uh, we'll go over what this year looked like uh, in terms of rain, snow, temperature, and salt usage. Um, then we'll take a look at our a few different graphs. So the first graph is a sanding, salting, and plowing only graph of both regular and overtime hours spent. Um, and then we will look at the same thing with snow removal, uh, regular and overtime hours. And then we will look at a graph that combines all of those uh, sanding, salting, plowing, and snow removal um, and with also equipment. Then we'll look at the yearly comparison of the tickets. Um, We'll review some of the pros and cons, and then we'll talk about next steps and where we would like to head from there. Uh, so as you all can, can see in the, the 2020 season, uh, 2021 season, the temperature was a little bit cooler uh, than the previous season from of uh, 2019 to 2020. Um, we had last year, we had about 71 inches of snow. This year we had 61 inches. Um, and last year we had around 18 inches of precipitation and this winter was 13. So not as bad of a winter um, in terms of severity, uh, but it, it did also have its challenges. So here's a graph. Um, many of you are probably familiar with what this graph looked like a, a year ago. Uh, I added another year out. Um, so as you can see this year, we spent, um, well, we used the 1900 tons of salt uh, the, the corresponding snowfall is, was 61 inches, as I just previously said. The temperature was on average 28 degrees with lower precipitation. Um, we had previously talked about the number of uh, overtime hours is for some reason a kind of a correspondent to the um, actual number of tons of salt that is uh, used every year. Um, so as we get a little bit further, we'll talk about that um, in more detail. So this graph shows a comparison from 2021 to 2020, um, broken down by personnel, uh, regular hours uh, from people worked, uh, overtime hours from people, and then equipment uh, from both 20 and 21. As you can see, um, we spent Pretty much across the board, we spent less hours um, doing salting, sanding, and plowing, which translated to uh, less cost. Um, now, do also keep in mind that the winter was not quite as bad as the previous, um, but there are obviously some, some me measurable benefits um, for moving to the, um, this alternate system. When we look at snow removal, uh, it was fairly comparable for the two years. We actually spent a little bit more in terms of personnel cost um, and equipment cost um, for this, uh, this winter season in comparison to the previous winter season. Uh, but overall, it was um, it pretty similar for um, the two years that we had. They were, they were close in severity and uh, the, the snow removal uh, regular and overtime hours spent were fairly, uh, were about a wash. They were fairly similar. 
So now if we take a look at uh, everything kind of all together, uh, you can see that in 2020, um, we had about $70,000 in winter related costs and snow removal related costs. And then in this year, we had uh, roughly 49,000. On the equipment side of things, we had around 215,000 in, in the 2020 winter. And in the 2020, sorry, the 2020 winter had around 215,000. And then 2021 had um, 175 or so. Um, and then if we look at the regular hours spent um, for winter related operations, um, you can see a fairly dramatic decrease there as well. So what does this mean um, for, how does this compare with the tickets uh, that we issued for this year? So as you can see, we, there was a fairly drastic increase in the amount of tickets, which was, um, we kind of expected because we were regulating a lot more streets um, than we previously were. Uh, so in, in 2018, we had 2018, 19 and 20, those were all the old, the parking ban system. And then this year was the alternate uh, parking ban. Um, so as you can see, the tickets um, have dramatically increased, but the number of ban events um, was this year was zero, and that translated into um, far fewer cars being towed. Um, just beneath that, you'll see that um, a breakdown of the violations in 2021. There were 509 violations per even day, 240 in the downtown, and 463 for odd day violations. Um, so the no parking in the downtown, the 240 uh, for, two, for 2021 is comparable to 2020, the 197. Um, those, there was a two, two streets added, um, the lower section of Elm Street and uh, a section of um, School Street. So, um, it was kind of expected that that number would be up a little bit and it fairly closely followed the previous year. Here is a breakdown of the tickets that were issued by individual street. So we, we totaled uh, 1200 tickets this year. And as you can see, uh, there were some streets that had uh, a higher level of non-compliance. Um, the major ones were Berry Street, Elm Street, Liberty, Liberty, Loomis, and uh, Summer Street. So pros and cons. Um, I've talked with staff about uh, how they thought the, this past winter went. Uh, they really actually enjoyed uh, having the alternate side uh, parking system. Um, it really gave them a lot of autonomy to do the work that they needed uh, without having to manually go post signs, um, they could really adapt if the weather changed. So if, if we started the morning with doing snow removal on Berry Street, and then uh, we had some winter weather and we had to stop and go plow or salt, we were able to do that. And no one really, that we hadn't told people that we were gonna do snow removal. So it wasn't a big deal. Um, we had that, that luxury to come in and go out and to do what we needed to. Um, and that would seem to be very effective. Um, some of the other pros that we had for this year was we had almost no emergency access issues. Um, we were able to keep the snow banks removed and clear um, for, um, for emergency access. Uh, there were a few things early on that we had some emergency access issues. Uh, however, we, we worked to resolve those and one of them was on one senior Crosby. It just wasn't working out. So we uh, reverted back to the old system uh, for that street. We, we towed very few cars this year. Um, and also we had way less complaints than in the previous year. We were able to provide in what, in my mind, it was a better level of service. Um, as we spoke about before, we managed the costs uh, better throughout the whole winter season. And we didn't have to do any manual posting. Uh, there were a few times that we did just as kind of, uh, you know, just a courtesy uh, for the snow removal that we were doing. Um, some of the cons that we did experience, um, we had to have an employee assist with ticketing. Um, it, that was a DPW employee. It was a heavier lift for the police department. Um, 
So we, what we were asking them to do um, was to go out and to look at a lot of streets during the night and to issue tickets. And so five years ago, they had a, a list of that was very short and they could really go through the routine um, in a matter of minutes. And then, um, then that changed this year. And um, there was, you know, they had to spend a couple hours each night um, going out and actually assessing um, the wrong, uh, who was parked incorrectly and issuing tickets. The other thing that I think took a little bit of time to get acclimated to was um, just figuring out which side was which. And they, you know, they felt like when it was dark out that they had to shine their lights on houses and stuff, which didn't really make them feel completely comfortable doing that. Um, but I think as the winter went on, they got a better handle on it. And, um, but it still is something that um, we should maybe think about how we want to address that. Um, we did issue twice as many tickets. Uh, there were some areas where um, we had a very high level of non-compliance. Um, one area in particular was over on Elm Street. Uh, Elm Street, even though it's mostly residential, does have a couple businesses. Um, they have a dentist and a chiropractor. And uh, the people that were coming into those businesses were consistently getting tickets all year round. Um, and so it would be nice to find a way to... Um, have a better solution for them. Um, and then lastly, the alternate side system, it's just not a, it wasn't a perfect fit for every street. Um, I know we talked about streets with uh, only one-sided parking, um, like East State Street, Cedar, and some of those streets were ones that we also did have um, ticketing issues as well. Um, so the next things that we're that I would like to talk about are where do we go from here? And um, I do have a I have this image. Um, I've been working with a vendor to get some conceptual designs for potentially a uh, some signs. Um, so that it's an illuminated sign that is activated uh, through either your cell phone or the internet, and. The way that it works is when you illuminate the sign, uh, there's a sign underneath it and says no parking when flashing, or you can really um, make the, you can have the sign say whatever you need. Um, so the thought is that it may be a good solution in some particular areas uh, to have a sign like this. Um, you know, the biggest one that comes to mind is Elm Street. It was the area with the highest number of tickets. It was the area that we seemed to be fighting the most amount of complaints, appeals. Um, so something like this could, uh, it could help with, um, it would give us the autonomy to illuminate the light only when we needed to do a snow removal event. Um, with that being said, I will open it up for any questions that you all may have. So just to clarify, so you would be thinking about this uh, sort of a no parking sign that would be illuminated potentially for places like Elm Street um, or uh, some of these other streets for which this was not working well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. Um, okay. Elm Street is the big one. Uh, Barry Street, we had a high level of tickets. However, we didn't have the same type of complaints on Barry Street. Um, and they weren't okay. specifically isolated around a particular business. Okay. And the, so it, would that change, if we were going to pursue that, uh, I, I assume that would also accompany some ordinance language change or not so much? It, there would be a little bit because um, the ordinance as written didn't have any, yeah, you would need to, you probably need to add a section that didn't that wasn't odd or even and it was only under a light indication right okay okay i think i saw some hands um so i'm gonna go lauren jack then connor yeah thanks um this is really helpful zach thank you um one question i had so just thinking about you know this was obviously a year where there's less people coming into town than usual for state house business for city or state business. Um, 
just curious your thoughts, like having reflected back on the last, um, you know, trying this this season. I mean, I would just imagine like the non-compliance or like the tickets would go up significantly, at least the first year where it was a more normal year where you have a lot of people from out of town that aren't familiar with the streets. Just just curious how you think this would go in a um, in a year with a lot of out of town visitors compared to this year. Yeah, so um, it was interesting because before I looked, took like a closer look at the data, I would have told you that I thought we issued a higher number of tickets to non-residents, like so daytime tickets. Um, and it was Jack that asked me to, to take a look at it. And when I did that, I found that we issued the, like two thirds of our tickets to residents at the nighttime. Um, well, I assume that the residents, we don't exactly know, but the way that I kind of broke it out is that if it was between midnight and 6.59, I generally assume that those were residents getting tickets. And if they were say after 7 a.m., that those were people that were coming into the city. It's not exactly, you know, the the best um, because you don't actually, there's there could be people that work night shift and are coming in. Um, so that was very surprising to me because I 100% thought it was going to be all of the people that were coming into the city because that's where we're, that's where we were hearing most of the complaints. I don't know if the people that were getting tickets were just kind of okay with it and, um, I did hear from a couple of people that they kind of just told me it's the cost of doing business. And if I get a ticket every other night, you know, that's seven and a half dollars. Like I can put that in my budget. Um, so I don't know how much of that there was. Um, there were, you know, when I looked at the license plates, there wasn't one. I mean, there was a couple license plates that got a lot of tickets, um, but there wasn't really one that just stuck out. So uh, I don't really know how it's going to be long term. Uh, I think it would still need to be, we still need to educate. Um, I'm hopeful that we can try it again for another winter and get another kind of season under our belt and then reevaluate the effectiveness of the program um, with two years data. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jack. Thanks. Um, I've got a few you know, questions or observations, and I think this is a great report. And then I, I took up a lot of Bill's and Brian's and uh, Zach's and Corey's time yesterday and today trying to get, trying to figure out what this, all this data teaches us. Because one of the things that I was thinking was, well, geez, 1,200 tickets means we're really kind of slamming people but and so I uh, started doing my own calculations and Zach did his own calculations about about the costs and uh, the aggregate cost of tickets and towing this winter was eighteen thousand four hundred fifty dollars and the aggregate cost for tickets and towing in uh, 2019, which is, I think is more comparable than 2020, was $32,740. So even though we issued a lot more tickets in 2021, we still charged parkers a lot more two years ago when we were towing them instead of ticking them, ticketing them. And I think we could also, everyone would agree that it's a lot worse to go out to the street and find that your car has been towed than ticketed. So from that perspective, I think it's uh, it worked well. A another thing that I uh, was interested in, and I don't think we really have an answer, is you know I noticed that Barry Street and Elm Street were the biggest uh, biggest streets for tickets, and so I was wondering, well, are we disproportionately affecting some uh, segment of the population or people who don't have uh, a lot of money uh, getting hit harder. And it's, it's kind of hard to say that because as Brian told me, the only way we would really be able to analyze who's getting the tickets is by having someone sit down and manually go through all 1200 tickets and figuring out something about them. But although those two streets were the biggest uh, ticketed streets, right under them were uh, 
or, or the next cluster of uh, seat of streets were like Liberty, Loomis, um, what Hubbard, um, and, and spring or summer, summer, I think. Yeah, the Meadow, Liberty, Loomis, um, you know, all of those had 40 or, or 50 tickets a piece. Yeah. So I don't think there's enough information to say that uh, we're disproportionately affecting uh, a segment of the population, although that might bear some uh, further scrutiny. Um, and then I think the last question I have is um, what happens um, when someone appeals their their ticket. The, what are the arguments or what are the reasons they give and how likely are people to not or to get their ticket uh, voided if they do appeal? So I think this year we were fairly generous on the appeals um, because we did have you know quite a bit of sympathy with, I mean, a lot of what we heard was, I didn't know about this. I don't live in Montpelier. I'm coming to Montpelier, um, you know, for, once a once a month or not even I'm coming for a dentist appointment. Um, how was I supposed to know? There was no signage. Um, and then when we would say that there was signage, they would say, "Well, okay, fine. It's too small." Um, so you know, I I think um, you know in in general there were most of the complaints were the ones that we kind of predicted we were going to have. Um, you know, there were certain places that just felt that we should make an exemption for them because there was a business nearby. Um, and then other than that, it was a lot of, um, well, I didn't really know about this, you know, I'm coming in. And then, you know, I think the residents that were getting ticketed, and I heard this from a couple people that, you know, some of them just said, well, I screwed up and I parked behind the wrong, you know, there was a couple cars there and I parked, I followed the lead of someone else and it was the wrong decision and I should have gone and looked at the signs and, you know, that was my bad. Um, so I think we got a little bit of everything on that, on that front. Um, but I think the biggest complaints were that people still didn't know about it. Um, that, you know, they said that they were from out of state or not out of state, but out of town. Um, those were some of the biggest things along with signage. The other thing was signage, um, you know, either conflicting signs, which we were actively addressing all winter long. Um, if there was a, a sign that conflicted it, we made sure that we uh, went out and either put a bag on it, took it down. Um, so there was, there was some of that as well. Well, thanks. Overall, I thought this was a great report and it makes me think that this was uh a successful experiment. I think, you know, we'll, we don't have a lot of pe residents here wanting to talk about it tonight, but as the fall approaches and we're talking about, we, if we talk about doing it again, I would hope we get some uh, resident input. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Connor, and then Jonna. Yeah, great, great presentation, um, Zach. And I, I appreciate DPW was really nimble throughout this. And that like if you had a group of constituents who raised an issue with a particular street, you know, you were adjusting as you went along. Um, so it wasn't written in stone right from the beginning. Um, question I had was, I, I thought we had implemented a pretty long grace period um, this winter where we didn't ticket people. So how many weeks did we actually ticket people this year compared to weeks in the past? So this year we ticketed from 12, eight to right around March 23rd. Um, at that point, the it was getting to be nice. So our, the DPW person that was doing the ticketing, I had him go into the street sweeper so we could leverage street sweeping while we were on still in the alternate side program. Um, and so typically, you know, we're starting the winter ban as early as like 11, 15. Um, and, but most of that action doesn't occur until like until you get into December because that's when the, the real heavy snow starts coming anyways. And that's when you have, you're calling winter ban events. Um, so yeah, we probably missed about that front month window um, from November 15th to December 8th or so. And then the end date is always April 1st. Um, so we pretty much went all the way out on that, on that end uh, minus a week.
Um, Jonna? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, great report. Do you also have the data of how many tickets you voided? You said you were generous. How generous? I don't have an exact number on that. I could get it for you, Donna. Um, that is, it was a little, I tried to get it out of the data. It was a little hard to, to actually see because there's some people that there have past due payments, right? So yeah. it, it was just a little bit hard to get an exact number on that because well, they're- Yeah, because part of my question related to that is, did ticketing, do you have it by month? Did, did people get better? Uh, was there a learning curve for some people? Now, I know people on my street, North Franklin, they would just mess up, like you said. Well, I saw her car, so I parked behind it, and it was the wrong side. <laughs> um, and they got a lot of tickets over here, but they just knew it was their mistake. Um, and then they caught on. By your second month, they were getting pretty smart about it. So I wondered if the tickets decreased by month. or I could... I had I had the data and it is formatted in a way that I could do that. Of course, I didn't yeah. prepare that um, at, at this time, but it's it's all ready, it's all readily available, and that I could actually come up with an answer fairly quickly on. That'd be I would like to know, and the and I do appreciate the ones you voided because that's showing that we listened and we're trying. But I do wonder about the businesses. Are a way that we could give them. <clears throat> information that they could insert by the person in their office who makes an appointment, especially on Elm Street. That upper Elm Street is mostly offices. So um, we, we did work fairly closely and we gave them the flyers and we, you know, we asked them to like, we had the conversation like, well, do you send out appointment reminders and via email? Cause nowadays everyone gets a reminder, you're going to the dentist tomorrow. And so like, the natural instinct was, well, when you send that notification out, why don't you attach the flyer and say, well, and reminder, make sure you park on the correct side of the street. But I, I don't know if they actually utilized that flyer in that way, if they really um, did what they needed to on their end. Um, you know, we tried to support them with that. We offered to give them some cones to help, you know, it put out cones on the days that they shouldn't be parking in front of their businesses. Um, so we, we made some attempts there. Um, so I'm not really, I'm not 100% sure how else to change that. Um, you know, I, I think from the person, the DPW individual that was doing the ticketing, there were like a couple hot spots. Like even on Berry Street, it was near the coffee shop, right? Um, that was one of the areas that there was always parking um, violations on. And at the corner on Elm Street at the at Spring Street, um, the the dent there was two locations. There was a chiropractor and a dentist, and both of those had a, they actually they struggled a lot, and they both reached out to us and asked for exemptions. Um, and so, those are two locations that if we did get an illuminated sign, that I would actually that I would like to put it there um, because I think that it would it would help to really reduce probably all of the ticketing, the majority of the ticketing on, let's just say, Elm Street. Well, I want to help them. I just don't want more signs, especially as big as these guys. Uh, yeah. So I guess I would hope this next year, are you thinking we need to do signs this coming year, next winter? Or are we going to try to just do other things to make it improve? That's I, guess, that's, I guess, up to uh, you all. Um, you know, we could we could look at getting one or two signs for trial and see how they work out. Um, the illuminated, the nice thing about the illuminated signs is they would go up on a post and I think I would be able to remove five other signs on the street because on Elm street, there's spring street, there's vine street that like every, there's so many signs because every intersection you had to put a new sign so that when someone turned on to the road, they couldn't claim that they didn't, get a sign that they didn't see a sign even though that was one of one of the complaints that we heard a lot um so mm -hmm. with an illuminated light you know the thought is that maybe you could actually reduce some of the signs but that is one of the other complaints that we heard is like you guys just have way too many signs out there and you have sign pollution um and i don't really disagree um because there are so many signs out there already 
Okay, and to go back, and you were around, I believe, way back when Tom first suggested we might do something uh, of this year-round change, of not just winter parking. I thought you also mentioned that we might consider doing alternate parking year round. I would, I would love to still be in the same format right now because it would, we'd actually have the ability to get to the curb line and be on some of these streets and sweep. Right now, we're we're weaving in and out, and you know, it's it's so I mean, sad to see the debris that's left behind instead of a clean street. Um, I would like to see us to do this year round. I, I really would that we just, and that people get to know it and we get posted and we able to do it with less signage on the street. Um, so that's where I'm aiming, thank you. Yeah. And just as a comment on whether or not to move forward with a sign uh, for a particular, the, for the locations that maybe it was not working very well or this plan wasn't working very well that I, I would be absolutely in, in favor of that especially if it's just a couple and we're going to try them out and see how it works um that that seems uh reasonable it also feels like it could be the kind of thing that's like a slippery slope and then everybody wants a sign um but if we can say you know that there's there's some good reason for these particular locations then that seems fair for now um, Jack, go ahead. Yes, I just had one more question. Um, your your presentation mentions that uh, doing the ticketing at night was uh, was burdensome for the police. Um, I certainly see that, but you there was never an occasion where you were uh, bringing police officers in who were not already on duty that night to uh, to do ticketing, was there? Uh, not to my knowledge, but uh, I would just have to confirm with with Chief P. I don't believe that they had to pay anyone overtime. I, I think that they, I think if it if push came to shove, they were not enforced. If they got called out to do something, then it was known that their priority was policing first um, over yeah. you know parking enforcement. Um, That's what I figured. Thanks. Yeah. Other. Questions, thoughts? <clears throat> um, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, actually, I had, I had one question. Um, you know, the one the one comment that I received from constituents was um, a complaint about the idea that, you know, especially on sunny days, that they had to go back and switch the cars back and forth on either side of the street. Um, you mentioned that the complaints o overall were were less. Um, does that factor in all complaints, not just um, you towed my car complaints or or those type? Is is that just factoring in any any complaint about the system whatsoever? Yeah, I mean we don't track calls in a way like a dispatch unit would, so it's a little mm -hmm. hard to actually like quantify. Um, most of it is just based off um, the, the people that are taking the majority of the calls, that there seemed to just be a lot less. There were certain uh, things that we heard, like the signs and, uh, you know, I didn't hear too much about um, having to move it on sunny days or, you know, um, there was some front porch forum chatter about people kind of disliking it. Um, and, you know, um, I think, on, you know, at least on front porch forum, you're always gonna kind of get a little bit of both sides. Um, and then we had residents on Prospect Street that said, you know, the cost of, you know, having to move your car every day, you know, it's at the end, at the end of all of this, it's, it's not so bad. Yes, it's a little bit of a burden, but we didn't have to go find a different area to park. We were able to park in our street and it was just on the other side. Um, so was that, did you hear a lot of that, uh, Dan? Or no. Was, yeah, not not significant. That's why I, I hesitate even to sort of raise this because it. I mean, I had individuals complain um, of that in part um, out of frustration, um, but it wasn't it wasn't any sort of overwhelming. So I'm just I'm just wondering if there is, um, you know, especially when you talk about the number of complaints that you get or not, how that was sort of quantified, and if there was. Um, 
a specific, you know, because I think I think the system, if anything, and I think your feedback shows this, which is that for certain snow events, this was a better system, which is people didn't have to find new places. You didn't have a lot of people towed because of a snow event. Um, you know, those pieces of it worked the best. And I just wondered if, you know, if people saw that as a, a trade-off or if people were frustrated, you know, it's a, it's a sunny day, why am I moving my car? Because uh, I wouldn't have touched my car otherwise. Um, and, and if there was any sort of line of feedback, but it sounds like that may have just been incorporated with the general feedback, which overall was much lower. Yep, that is correct. Okay. Right. Yeah, other... note, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd just like to note that, again, the alternative backdrop to all of this was we used to have a blanket winter ban mm -hmm. from November 15 to April 1st um, for overnight parking on any street. And people were scrambling every night, regardless of the weather, to find mm -hmm. alternate parking. And, you know, so, um, and that was proving to be burdensome to people. And uh, so we came up with the winter ban and that had its own set of problems. I think that there's always going to be those trade-offs. So, you know, I, I, I say this, you know, recognizing the best intentions of all people, but I'm sure people would like a perfect system where they don't have to move anything on the sunny days and then magically know exactly what to do when the storms hit and don't disrupt the snow removal. But it's, you know, we haven't really found that. Um, so there's going to be, you know, I think one of the things we really wanted to do was weigh the trade-offs like Zach did with, you know, here's sort of what worked and what didn't and what the impact were to people. And, and uh, you know, perhaps do it another winter, like as Lauren mentioned, when we may we have a more, more normal uh, usage to really get a sense of how it works and then, value, you know, continue evaluating it. And the same with the potential alternatives. I don't think we're here to say, you know, buy these signs tonight or anything. I think we're here to say, look, here's these issues, here's potential solutions. We're going to look at them and talk about it again come late summer or fall when we get ready to wind this up. You know, I will say that from my conversations with PD and my conversations with the DPW employees, if we asked them their preference, they would rather go back to the old system. It was less cumbersome for everyone, but that doesn't always, nest that, I mean, that doesn't take into account the complaints and the burden that we're putting on on the residents. And so- yeah, It's less cumbersome for city staff, but, but definitely not friendly to residents. Um, so the, the biggest benefit to this system in, that we had this year was you could adapt, right? If the, if we were doing snow removal on Berry street and we got to Hubbard, Hubbard street and it started to snow, we could stop what we were doing and we could go to snow, either salting or plowing. And it didn't matter. We didn't have to, you know, our plans hadn't changed. We hadn't put it out on social media that we we're going to do snow removal. We hadn't coordinated with towing or any of the other stuff. We had the autonomy to, to do what we needed to do and change um, really at the whim of the weather, um, because that's at the end of, at the end of all this, we don't always, we don't dictate what we have to do. It's, it's the weather, it's the conditions. Um, so. Uh, Jay and then Donna. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that I think for rolling out of a new system like this, obviously there's a lot of learning to be done and fine tuning and accommodating, but for, for a new system, I think overall looking at this data, um, Zach and Don, I think it, it was very successful um, and, and I appreciate it. And, and to me, um, you know, think, you know, I know Dan heard from folks and, and I heard from folks, we all heard from people about, you know, sort of that transition into this new system. I think probably, um, one of the main, if not the main reason that it, the rollout was as, as successful was, was because you were really accommodating. Um, and, you know, you, you listen to folks like particularly steep, narrow streets like Cliff Street or, you know, uh, Montino Crosby or where you could say, all right, yeah, well, this is how we set it up. But we, can, we, we, we acknowledge that it's not working for you, so we're going to make it work for you. So, you know, having that mentality that it, it was a partnership. 
I think was really important. So as we look to, you know, potentially doing this for another season, continuing that <clears throat> sort of partnership thought process, thought process will, will go a long way. And, and so whether, whether it's with, you know, with new lighting or um, considering how we're accommodating some of these um, commercial areas like Lake on Elm Street and Lake on Berry Street, I think will, you know, help continue the, the success of the, uh, of, of this new process. So I just want to say thanks for that. I think it, it really, it, it uh, made a difference and, and will help this, this, you know, system, you know, be more successful moving forward. So thanks. Uh, Donna. I just had a couple of questions. One was when you said you liked the old way, you meant the total street ban. Old way? Not, not me, not me personally, but in terms the of staff. Our, the staff, yes. Okay. Like I just no wanted to clarify which old way. So yes, because then you didn't have any problem. They were mostly empty. And that was uh, the same for PD, is that it was yeah, they had only, bare, like no issues because there was no one was on the street ever. So <laughs> Yes, you looked really odd parking on the street then. Yeah. And uh, my second question was, are you or DPW looking for us to say uh, definitively move forward? We want to continue this and keep fine tuning it. Do you need some guidance from us tonight? Or maybe um, I can fill that question. Um, I don't think, I think we came into it mostly as just a debrief tonight. Um, if you guys were ready to move forward with, um, I guess I'll let Bill, uh, speak on that. Um, I don't. Well, really I just know. don't think we're ready to make a recommend a hard recommendation yet. At least last I knew. Um, I think we wanted to talk it I all guess, over. I just wanted to give enough support that you continue to refine it and think about what would solve some of the problems. And if yep. it is those signs, those light signs, then what's the cost? Um, that would also be helpful to know. The and where would twenty four hundred dollars a unit? Um, Excuse me. So that, $2,400 per, per location. Um, so they're fairly similar to similar to the rapid flash and beacons. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Um, so obviously you don't want to put them on every street and you could have to be a little bit strategic in, in kind of rolling those out. And there is, from the one manufacturer that we're looking at, there is a kind of a long lead time. So, I mean, this could be something that we could continue to review the data and we come back in the next couple months and with a recommendation to you all about whether or not we should or shouldn't purchase a sign or how we're um, recommending moving forward. That would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I, I will just jump in and say that um, I appreciate all the comments tonight. I think um, Zach and my um, expectation was that this was our opportunity just to go over the data, to give you the information, to hear your thoughts, but also so that you can give some additional thought to it. And we'll definitely want to come back and talk about this again at, in the context of do we go forward, um, looking at the lights, looking at the options. And I would say that, um, you know, we did not put out to the entire community um, half a year in advance or at the tail end of the winter season preceding this past year that we were going to change to this um, procedure. So we came at it and I think, um, while we weren't in a, a, a rush to do anything, I think it was something new and changing behavior is something that takes people quite a while to get used to. First, they're going to reject that for the most part, then they're going to figure out what their problems are, then they're going to still potentially dislike what's going on before they actually get into a habit. And I think, um, I think that it's in our best interest, at least from my perspective, that we really think about another year to, um, to um, look at, tweak some things, whether that's lights or other things, maybe different messaging, maybe um, some other um, ideas that pop up, um, and then make a real decision about whether we're gonna keep the system or how we're going to continue to move forward. Um, 
And um, so uh, I think we've been expecting in the department that we'll have another conversation with you sometime soon. Okay, that's helpful. So I, it also, well, it's helpful to clarify that you really aren't looking for a, any kind of vote at this point. So, but thank, well, th thank you though. This has been very helpful. It is really useful to know that uh, we, yes, it, we did issue a lot more tickets, but the towing was way down and we ended up uh, costing city residents uh, a lot less money in total. That I think is, is very interesting. Um, so, um, great, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Uh, yeah, Donna, go ahead. This is peripheral, but being on the bike pedestrian committee, I really heard a lot about not cleaning all the way to the curb. And, and so that's part of why I also want to get cars out of the road when you're cleaning streets is so that the bicyclists do not have debris. Is there a way to make sure that we do get way over and clean so that bicyclists don't have this debris that they're riding on? I mean, the easiest thing is to consistently get the cars out of there. And so that, cause it's, you know, with the debris on the side of the road, it, it takes several passes before the street's actually clean. It's not like you just go over it and it's magically, you know, all good. So it, you know, it takes many passes and it is a little hard to get the brooms like right up tight. I mean, in, in terms of like within the last six inches, but um, you know, I would say that they're able to ride along the curb within six inches or maybe even a little bit closer. Um, but, you know, they also run the risk if they get too far over that they, um, if they get stuck, the, you know, it can screw up the, the brooms. Um, if they get it caught on the curb, they'll b they actually bend the arm and that has happened. And our mechanics really dislike when that happens. So um, they have to be careful mm -hmm. and aware of where they are. So especially on turns and stuff, that's, they're usually a little bit generous when they come out of it because they don't want to get that piece stuck on a piece of the curbing. Um, but the biggest thing to help get all of the debris to the curb would be to get the cars off the street. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you. I appreciate thank all your you. work on, on this. Uh, all right, so we are up to our um, last business item, which is the summer schedule. And so for this, I guess I'll turn it over to Bill. Yeah, this is a terribly complicated issue. Yeah. <laughs> Just typically we drop one of our summer meetings. Um, over the last few years, it's been in August. Um, we, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Just seems to be the way it's fallen. I see, you know, when if you if we just drop one meeting, then sometimes we go a whole month, you know, four or five weeks without meeting. So, I suggested that we split the difference between the two normal August meetings and and go on the third week instead, the fifteenth, just to have the one meeting in August. But you know, you we don't have to drop any meetings. We can keep our regular meetings. We can drop any different. So I just frankly put the one that worked best for me. So <laughs> just full disclosure, <laughs> but, but um, we can make it work, however. So, or, or, you know, it might be a little early to decide, but the sooner we do, the sooner we can plan for it. Um, I will almost certainly not be available for the July 28th meeting, but uh, we have competent people here. You can get along without me. Well, that could be the one we dropped too. Other thoughts? I also may be gone on the 28th. Okay. Yeah. I'm uh, probably going to be gone on the 23rd of June. I, I might be as well on that one. For the 23rd? Of June, yeah. Of June, okay. Uh, Lauren, I feel like you're about to say something. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I also am likely out July for the July 28th one. Um, 
I think the earlier July one I can do, but I would be remote, which might be our first in-person one, which would be a real bummer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. That's right. Huh. That's interesting. Wait, like, well, do we, we particularly just to say, sorry, go ahead. The way to solve that problem, we just cancel all our summer meetings and then we don't have to decide how. It's no business we need to do. One it's meeting. fine. <laughs> uh, Jack. Well, um, or, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I think this proposal is fine. You know me, I don't like to skip meetings because I like to have our, our meet come to our meetings, but uh, it sounds like July 28th might be a better meeting to skip than, uh, than August 25th. Um, and I'd be happy to either solidify that schedule now or if uh, those of us who think they're going to be missing have uh, a date coming up fairly soon when you'll know with more certainty if you're going to be away then i'd be happy to wait but for right now if, if people think you know your schedule i would say let's pick the date to skip and set it up there's yeah, so there's a couple of things we could do. One is you could skip, we could we could skip July 28th and then just do the 11th and 25th in August as planned. I'd suggest the 18th just to to break those up, but we could just go back to the normal and have the July 28th one be the one we miss, or we could do the one just one in July, one in August. We've tried that before. Sometimes it gets a little uh, much, or we could send out. Um, I could have we could send out like a doodle poll of all the Wednesdays in July and August and see who's available on which days and see where we get the most attendance. And then decide it at the next meeting. Let's do that. We are a little early for this so that we're ahead of the game. Yeah, like I will know for sure whether or not I'm available on the 28th, probably within the next week or so. So yeah. So yeah. let's do that. And, yeah. Yeah, but, like uh, Jay, did you want to say something? Um, oops. So, uh, I, I was just, I think a doodle poll makes sense. I was going to, I agreed with Jack that if we, if it sounds like a bunch of folks would um, not be available on July 28th, that we should just sort of swap that for the August 25th date. Um, but if it's, makes more sense to just sort of put it out there and count our numbers that's fine i guess i'll also throw in since we're talking about it that probably the <clears throat> i'm guessing uh that lauren's with me on this but the june 9th um meeting will be available but be late um because apparently that's um the uh close the uh Union Elementary School graduation is happening that evening at the high school. So, um, anyways, so just putting that out there. I don't. We don't need to change that date, but just so folks know what's going on. That's good to know. Uh, well, so and actually, that all feels like some good reasons to do a doodle poll because, you know, maybe in June there's there's a different day that would work better for, for more folks. Um, maybe it's the first and third that month. I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah. Right. Other Why don't we send out, we'll send out all the Wednesdays in June, July, and August and see <laughs> just, just because you are available doesn't mean you're committing to meet. It just means we want to see which dates have critical mass and <laughs> assume that the default is the second and fourth Wednesday. Maybe we'll try to mark those somehow that those are the ones that would be, you know, tie goes to those dates. Are, are you assuming the six only one time for that poll, 630? Or are we going to get some options of time? Let's well? get the dates first. We have to, you know, if there's one meeting like the ninth that sounds better to start at seven or something. Well, I mean, doodle polls give you a choice of time too. I just, yeah, they do. I was just, in case gonna... people wanted to start later in the summer. Oh. Um, Usually people are early in the summer to get out and do summer night things, but whatever. Um, 
Because we start, we never get out early. So we start mm -hmm. later oh. in the evening. <laughs> well, I don't, you know, that's fine. Whatever, I think, sure, we can do that too. But I was really just thinking, let's get the dates lined up and then we can decide times. Yeah. Once we know which dates, then. Yeah. I'll be happy to send out the doodle poll tomorrow. Thanks, Mary. That's right. You're on. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so <clears throat> I think we're, I think we have clarity about this. I don't think we need a motion mm -hmm. or anything, right? Any other mm -hmm. comments about this? Okay, so we are on to council reports. Uh, and so I am going to go in the normal order, if that's okay, uh, starting with Donna. Isn't sure what you consider normal anymore. <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate getting an appointment to most of the committees I asked for. Thank you. And uh, I did want you all to know that I actually uh, was put in as chair for the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority Board. And one of my first official acts was a letter to the Senate Finance Committee dealing with H360 about broadband and how broadband bill right now proposed excludes handheld radios and public safety of communication features that also need fiber. So we're just asking them to expand their language um, to, the, to include municipals to use broadband services to enhance radio systems, to plan for the public safety communication systems that will be using wireless in the future. So we just are asking them to expand their definition so that municipals can also get money to, to use for the broadband in relation to their communication system. So I also reached out to our Washington delegates. So heads up, it's another plea from them to do something and pay attention. And any questions you all might have, please ask me. You can ask Dan, uh, he's got a copy of the letter. I sent one to Bill and Ann. I could be glad to send them to all of you if you're interested. Uh, so thank you very much. Great, uh, Connor. All right, a couple of things and uh... I don't want to steal John's thunder if he has a better update on this, but I was just uh, texting with Senator Parchlick and uh, our non-U.S. citizen ordinance got voted out of committee on Tuesday. It'll go to the floor at uh, one o'clock tomorrow and uh, Senator Polina will push that. Um, so, so that's huge. Uh, Senator Ballant, the president of the Senate, uh, was very passionate in caucus recently, said we never treat ordinances like this. You know, not, not on my watch, we're gonna get this passed. So um, that's really hopeful. They think they have the floor votes, but if you feel like you wanna call anybody in the meantime, that'd be good. You'll probably hear some pretty rough rhetoric about, uh, you know, some of our immigrant community on the floor tomorrow. But I, again, we've got some really good champions for this. And I, I think, you know, you know, John Odom thought of this uh, ages ago, right? Um, and has really done a lot of work. A lot of people here have done work. I know Dan did some of the legal heavy lifting on it. Um, so that's gonna be a great win for our city if we can get it over the finish line, I think. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody has additional information on that, but that's what I just heard from Senator Perklick. Um, other item, I had my first homelessness task force meeting today. Uh, really happy to be on that. I tell you, they don't pull any punches. Uh, <laughs> And they talk about elected officials and I, I appreciate it. Um, you know, we heard some staggering numbers last time when the task force was in and uh, really emphasized, hit it home today. You know, thousands of people are just gonna be leaving these hotels pretty soon. And, uh, you know, I think we've had a, a, a pretty calm period. Actually, you've seen some like shelter numbers decrease in some cases because, you know, if it's a choice between that and like a hotel room, you might go to the hotel room. Uh, but I, I think we've got a pretty rough bump on the horizon, so we're really going to have to be all hands on deck just to see how we handle that. Um, I, I had an idea I want to float out to you folks. Um, I get so much out of like doing some of the work site visits, you know, whether it be the water treatment or the fire station. Um, you know, if we're putting money behind positions, and it might be limited just because of uh, privacy issues, um, but I, I think it'd be great if we could get in a rotation of maybe Shadow and Dawn, the homelessness liaison. Uh, person we have or the social worker we have embedded in the police force, or at least just spend some time on an individual level as we consider refunding these positions um, in the next year or there. I, I think, you know, getting out there and talking to folks does so much more than a report would ever do and makes it a bit more real. So um, 
I'm going to be talking to Dawn about that, but I'll, I'll hopefully put something together that folks could maybe sign up the shadow or a little bit. So that's it for me. Thanks. Great. Uh, Jay. I actually don't have anything tonight. Thanks, though. Dan. Uh, so I took a tour, uh, as Connor uh, mentioned, that we uh, we do with the water treatment plant and uh, got a tour from Jeff Wilson, who's the operator, and really an impressive operation that he runs up there. And I commended the Public Works and Kurt for um, the tour. I felt better than I ever have having a glass of water after the tour of that facility. Um, but I certainly recommend it to anyone who hasn't taken that tour yet. Uh, it's really an impressive facility that's very well run um, and a credit to our city. And, and uh, you know, the water that we get um, is the cleanest in, in Vermont for surface water. Um, he said we lost only to one like groundwater system and he said that's not fair that's cheating <laughs> um but uh you know i think it's a really impressive system and 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 again you know another asset that we really have to keep our eyes on um in our in our city infrastructure <laughs> uh jack the glass is empty connor huh? <laughs> um couple of uh, points. One is that um, we know we have uh, a townwide assessment coming up. And I think we we just saw uh, a bad example of how to handle the uh, public information that aspect of it. And so I think that we can learn from the uh, mistakes in Burlington of how to do it better. And we were already ahead of doing it better because Bill had a, a piece in the bridge last year setting out how it works. But I think we'll, it'll be worthwhile to uh, keep up the public information so that people know what's uh, going on and, and realize that just because your assessment goes up does not necessarily mean you're tax bills going up. Um, I also have uh, have an article that I will be sharing with the members of the council. It was uh, from the, uh, actually an opinion piece from the New York Times earlier this month titled, How Lower Income Americans Get Cheated on Property Taxes. And uh, I'll just share that to uh, look at, uh, for us to consider if there's anything that uh, we should build into our uh, our system to uh, treat people fairly. And I think we do a good job of treat, treating people fairly uh, on taxes in, uh, in Montpelier. Um, and speaking of public works, Bill, were you gonna say something about the award? wasn't but okay well i i will i was uh i it, it's not really new news now it's old news but the montpelier public works department got uh, an award for the best local um, project from the american public works association and it's a it's a big deal for the uh, water resource recovery facility uh, project and this is a big deal and it reflects uh, how well uh, our entire team did on uh, having the vision to do the uh, do the project and then and then bringing it in so congratulations to uh, to everybody involved in the project um, and while we're talking about public works uh, Dan the water Water treatment plan. When I was working with uh, working on the uh, Murray Hill uh, water system extension, I learned that uh, the year that I was doing it, the Montpelier uh, water system uh, was rated the uh, the best ta tasting 
uh, surface water system in the state of Vermont. And uh, whatever else you hear, I, I think our public health is is well protected, and the uh, and the quality of the water is is great too. So that's all I've got. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Lauren. Thanks. Uh, yeah, just one thing. Just wanted to um, remind folks that we right now have a community equity survey out in the field. Uh, we're trying to hear from at least three hundred. Uh, community members, um, you can find it. Um, it's been posted to Front Porch Forum. It's up on Facebook. It's up various places or um, find my email address and I'll send you a link if you are having trouble finding it any other way um, up on the uh, city website. Um, but we're really hoping to hear from um, a wide swath of people. So anyone who wants to send it around to folks um, really want to be getting that input to inform our, our equity work that we're doing th through the social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Um, and we're on track for some, I think, really interesting input uh, for, for council in the coming months from that process. So looking forward to that. That's it for me tonight, thanks. Okay. Uh, question for the, oh wait, was it, uh, yeah, I guess it is my turn. Uh, question for the council, uh, do, Folks have any interest in taking tours as we have in the past of different city facilities? I mean, I know, um, uh, you know just for just thinking back to last year, we had the town town meeting day, and then boom, we were in COVID, so we really didn't get the chance to do tours last year. Um, I'm seeing some nods, thumb scale of like, yeah, I'd be interested in doing some tours. Okay, I have. Even though I've done tours multiple times, I feel like I always get something out of them. I think they're really helpful for us. And uh, and honestly, like, I think it helps us make better decisions <clears throat> on, on, you know, when it comes to things that pertain to, to departments. So um, is that something that I can uh, uh, just pitch to you there, Bill, to, to arrange? Maybe this, is a, maybe this is a doodle poll thing as well. No, that's okay. But I mean, are you talk, you're talking about group, all of you as a group, or just set some up? You know, I know some of you, some of them, have, you folks have been doing them individually, and others, you know, have some. We've done them a bunch of different ways. We've done them some years where we've warned them and had you know the council go, and other times when we did them in groups of three, or you know, how, however you want to. I'll, I'll just say I think we'll make really happen. Yeah, I appreciate going together with other people because I know I learn from the questions that other people ask. Um, but I realize I can be more of a bear to schedule. Uh, but Dan, go ahead. I was just gonna say I like the opposite. I, I like oh. I like the idea of just being alone and sort of getting the full attention of the the operator, you know, as opposed to sort of the tour group. But references. It's all good. No worries. Um, other thoughts? Well, we, they're, they're available to anybody at any time, whether you want to do them as a group or individual. I mean, obviously, we schedule them. And for some of our folks, it's obviously easier to do two or three than seven, but um, we will make it work, um, however you want to set it up. Yeah, uh, Donna, go ahead. Well, I just I like the interaction that we had as a council. There was a, of just doing the, the visiting together whether it was three or four of us or all of us, it was enjoyable in that way to be outside the council room. So if you post them, then we can all decide what we can do and th that's helpful. Yeah, and everyone may not be able to go to all of them or you know, they folks might wanna do some on their own, that's okay. Um, but I, I'm picturing tours of all the major departments uh, just to get familiar. Uh, I, you know, especially, sorry, uh, I, well, I'll say I just, I'm especially interested in um, the updates to the uh, water resource recovery facility. I know that's an ongoing project, but in as much as it's um, available for a tour, that I think would be very interesting. Yeah, I think they've asked us to wait about a month before we tour, have people touring just because of the construction status, but maybe yeah. as it wraps up, it'd be nice to tour. 
to see all the things that just got completed. So maybe what we'll do is just set up a series of, of tours with dates and let you all know that this is when the group tour is and those that can make it, make it and those that can't can are welcome to go to that particular thing on their own. And I imagine we do police, fire, the water treatment, sewer treatment, the DPW garage, rec facilities, uh, if you want to include senior center, um, city hall, if you want. Um, so, okay. uh, you know, you get too many that starts to wear people out, you, you all out. So. But okay. uh, maybe we'll schedule them over the next, you know, one, one every other week over the next 12 or 14 weeks or something. So that it's not too much. Great. Okay, thank you. Awesome. And by we, I mean Mary. <laughs> I know what you meant. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, also, just a heads up that uh, Seven Days got in touch with me asking about just opinions on this bill that would allow utilities more freedom, in making decisions, making authority, uh, or giving more authority to municipalities uh, instead of having to go through the charter amendment process all the time. So um, anyway, just, just a heads up, there's an article coming out about that soon. I hope you spoke in favor of that, Madam Mayor. I sure did. <laughs> the many charter amendments that we've passed over the past three years. My goodness, yes. <laughs> Had lots of examples to draw from. Anyway, um, so that is it from me, uh, John. Sorry, I was having button issues there. Uh, nothing, nothing. All is good. Okay, great. Um, all right, uh, and Bill. So the only thing I really have other than thank you, Jack, for reminding me to um, thank DPW for their great work and for their national award uh, is not great news. We just heard today from Congressman Welch's office that none of our projects were recommended for funding. Um, so that was a bummer. So we will now figure those in with, um, you know, our recommendations for federal funding. Interestingly, we also got, I think it was today or yesterday, something from Senator Sanders' office soliciting requests for funding. Uh, I don't know if this is a different pool or whether the senators and, you know, whether they're all going to, so we intend to resubmit them all through Senator Sanders' office and see how we do there. So uh, there you go. That's that's what, all I can tell you about those. So, um, but we are then be, being at least informed a little bit about this. We will be working on a presentation to you about federal federal what we expect for federal money, what we see as the, the lost revenue component, and what probably would have been done if we hadn't had to cut our budgets for, for that money. And then, uh, you know, what else fits in and obviously you'll have some room to move that stuff around yourselves. Um, we, we still haven't got the guidance yet on those funds. So we're still just working off the loose descriptions that we've had. We're hoping that before, you know, by the time we actually present to you, we will have more specific guidance from the treasury about exactly how those funds can be used and what what restrictions there are and those sorts of things. But, um, we'll, you know, we, yeah, we have a fair amount of lost revenue. Uh, um, so I think a, a vast, you know, a lot of it will fall into that category. If we can, you know, things that we were just going to do in our budget projects, equipment, those kinds of things that we had to cut out. Um, so hopefully we can restore some of those so we don't fall too far behind. So that's all I have. Sorry to end on that note. It's okay. It's good to know. We can still reapply with Sanders' office. We'll see. I will. Oh, uh, I will right. mention one thing. Seeing Constantinus' name still on the uh, screen reminded me um, to remind you all that, um, in addition to what we were just talking about, the police, we actually have all four of the our unions are, we're going to be negotiating this spring. That's will be a first for me. Um, 
you get two of them, uh, two of them. Well, first of all, having four is new because the police supervisors union is a relatively new unit, but um, both DPW and police are actually a year over. We just held them in, a, with their agreement, agreement, held them in abeyance throughout COVID to sort of see what happened financially and didn't, you know, just extended them. And then fire is, is expiring on June 30 and then the, the supervisors one is new. So obviously that's, that's just so, you know, that'll be a huge lift, um, you know, a, a time thing. But I, at the next meeting, I was gonna schedule um, an executive session with you all just to talk philosophy and issues. And if any of you would like to participate on any or all, be a council rep on the bargaining committee or uh, to talk about how we include the police issues uh, and those kinds of things in what is, you know, normally a pretty straightforward bargaining process um, and being respectful of the collective bargaining process and its impact on our budget. That's all, just a heads up, no reason to discuss now. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, everybody, thank you. Uh, and that is the end of our business. So without objection, we're going to adjourn 1040. Whew, seemed earlier. I don't know how it suddenly became 1040. <laughs> 45 <laughs> minutes on the consent agenda set us back. <laughs> That's all right. Okay, have a good evening, everyone. Good meeting, folks. See you next time. Thank you.